Are we ready? We're ready, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Welcome to the City Council meeting of May 6, 2021. It is 7.50 p.m. Uh, City Clerk Preamble, please. This meeting is compliant with the Governor's Executive Order N-29-20, issued on March 17, 2020, allowing for deviation of teleconference rules required by the Brown Act. The purpose of this is to provide the safest environment for staff, council members, and the public while allowing for public participation. The public may address the council using exclusively remote public comment options. The council may take action on any item listed in the agenda. Members of the public may view the city council meeting by logging into the Zoom webinar listed below. City council meetings can also be viewed live and or on demand via the city's YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Brisbane CA or on Comcast channel 27. Archive videos can be replayed on the city's website, um, forward slash, forward slash Brisbane CA org forward slash meetings. To address the council, the city council will be an exclusively virtual meeting. The city council agenda materials may be viewed online at Brisbane CA org at least 24 hours prior to a special meeting and at least 72 hours prior to a regular meeting. Meeting participants are encouraged to submit public comments in writing in advance of the meeting. And aside from commenting while in the Zoom webinar, the following email and text line will also be monitored during the meeting and public comments received will be noted for the record during oral communications one and two or during an item. Email ipadia at brisbaneca.org, text 6282192922, join the webinar at zoom.us with the ID 9919362 8666. And the call in number is 16699009128, and the passcode is 123456. If you need special assistance to participate in this meeting, please contact the city clerk at 415 508 2113. Thank you. Thank you. Item one uh, call to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I cannot hear anybody else or see anybody else, by the way, Ingrid. Okay, thank you. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States of America, States of America and, to the and to the Republic of the Republic which it stands, one nation under, one God, nation under God, indivisible with liberty, indivisible and, justice for all. With liberty and justice for all. Uh, item two, roll call, please. Council Member Davis. Here. Council Member Lentz. Here. Council Member Mackin. Here. Council Member O'Connell. Here. And Mayor Cunningham. Present, thank you. Can I get a report out from closed session, please? Yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, the council did took up three items in closed session. There was a report on anticipated litigation, which was just an update, no direction was required. Um, item E on the closed session agenda, uh, agenda is Grand Sierra. There was uh, direction sought from city staff and provided by the council. And item F, uh, about 25 Park Place, also council sought, uh, I'm sorry, staff sought city uh, council direction and received it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item three is adoption of the agenda. Staff has asked to amend the agenda to a new business, uh, to add a new business item on the grounds that it is a matter that arose after the agenda was posted and action on the item is needed before the city council meets again in regular session. The new business item is to consider approval of re resolutions number 2021-32, 2021-33, and 2021-34 of the City Council of the City of Brisbane for funding from the Forest Health Grant Program as provided through California Climate Investments. Uh, this will need a 4-5 vote to add to the agenda. Can I get a first and second to add this new business item, please? Make that motion. Second. I'll second. Oh, Thank go you. ahead. Thank you, Terry. Uh, roll call vote, okay. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member Mackin? Aye. And Ca Council Member O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Cunningham? Aye. 
Can I get a first and a second to uh, adopt the agenda as amended, please? I'll move we adopt the agenda as amended. Second. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lentz. Aye. Council Member Mackin. Aye. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Cunningham. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Um, moving on to item four, awards and presentations. At this time, we want to recognize important designations for the month of May with proclamations. I also want to take some time and recognize other important holidays for the month since it's our first city council meeting of the month. I want to recognize our community members celebrating Ramadan, sending you warm greetings during this holy time. Happy Cultural Diversity Day, which is on May 21st. Monday 31st is Memorial Day. Uh, let us honor the military personnel who have died in the performance of their military duties while serving in the United States Armed Forces. May is also Asian Pacific, Pacific Islander History Month. Um, item A, May as Mental Health Month Proclamation. So see if I can show everybody, this is our proclamation, which I will now read. May 2021 Mental Health Month. Whereas mental health and freedom from substance use issues is fundamental to the overall health and well-being of all community members in the city of Brisbane, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, sexual, sexual orientation, religion, or economic status. And whereas mental health and substance, substance use conditions affect one in four adults in the United States in 2019. Estimates suggest that one in four adults with a mental health condition are not receiving the help they need. And whereas mental health and substance use conditions are as treatable as other health conditions and people who have mental health and substance use issues can recover and lead full productive lives. And whereas the stigma prevents many from seeking services and support, education and contact with those sharing stories of hope and recovery are key to reducing this stigma. And whereas the 2021 May Mental Health Month, MHM, focuses on the theme, hashtag hope for change, the past year has brought unanticipated changes, leaving us to face these challenges and transform. Hashtag hope for change reminds us to spread hope and rely on the hope that carried us through a year of change. Whereas the San Mateo County MHM Planning Committee and partners have organized over 31 free virtual events that feature open mic, music, arts, film, pets, stories, children's stories, speaker panels, and more. Whereas San Mateo County Behavioral Health and Recovery Services staff, community partners, and clients, consumers, and family members dedicate themselves to promoting wellness, resilience, recovery, inclusion, and equity around mental health and substance use conditions and issues. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Brisbane hereby designates this month of May 2021 as Mental Health Month and calls upon community members and partners to recommit to reducing stigma and promoting wellness around mental health and substance use issues in the City of Brisbane and the larger community, dated May 6, 2021. Thank you. We have a guest who's going to be receiving the proclamation, Madam Mayor. Oh, wonderful. Mr. Chris Rasmussen. Good evening. I do, not, I do not have that. So, Chris. Good evening, thank you. Can I say a few words? Absolutely. Great, my name is Chris Rasmussen and I'm a commissioner with the San Mateo County Mental Health and Substance Abuse Recovery Commission. On behalf of the commission and the Mental Health Planning Committee, thank you for recognizing May 2021 as Mental Health Month. Stigma and lack of awareness of resources are some of the key barriers preventing people from getting help around mental health and substance use issues. Mental Health Month is one of the best ways of the year to increase awareness and inspire action to reduce stigma against those facing mental health and substance use issues. As you said, this year's theme is hope for change. The San Mateo County Mental Health Planning Committee, actually we've, we've, we're up to over 50 events now, which is pretty awesome. Um, and they're gonna target all those age groups that you, you had mentioned. 
All events are free, so please sign up. To help support Mental Health Month, I urge all of you to speak and talk openly about mental health issues. The importance of talking about mental health cannot be overstressed. I urge all of you to use Mental Health Month as a way to talk about mental health. Mention that Mental Health Month at your next meeting, club meeting, work meeting, and to your family and friends. And finally, visit one of the virtual event months, virtual events planned for this month, <laughs> ultimately, ultimately during this month. I just wanna remind everyone that mental illness is a real and recovery is possible. It's possible to find balance between life's ups and downs and continue to hope for change with the challenges brought on by the pandemic. We have a website, smchealth.org slash mental health month, where you can find all of the events. And thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for, thanks for that. Do we have any other guests, Ingrid, who wish to speak? There are no more guests, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you very much. So moving on to item B, May is Wildfire Preparedness Month. We have a Wildfire Preparedness Proclamation, which hopefully you can see and I will now read. Um, Wildfire Preparedness Month 2021 Proclamation. Whereas over the last four years, California has experienced seven of the deadliest and 13 of the most destructive wildfires in the state history. And whereas nationally, there's been a 163% increase in the number of structures lost in wildfires per year over the last decade. And whereas Zone Haven has been adopted as a countywide tool to assist with informed evacuations during wildfire, and we encourage know your zone before an emergency arises. And whereas each year, more people move into wildland urban interface areas, increasing the need to raise awareness to our citizens on how they can protect their property from wildfire losses. And whereas the North County Fire Authority encourages fire safe behavior by all who live, work and recreate throughout the city of Brisbane. And whereas each of us can do our part to prepare for wildfire emergencies by taking steps to make effective changes to our homes and landscapes to reduce the risk of wildfire. And whereas if we work together collaboratively and with the awareness, we can remain strong and resilient. Now, therefore, I, Karen Cunningham, Mayor of the City of Brisbane, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim May 2021 as Wildfire Preparedness Month and encourage all Brisbane residents to increase their knowledge and awareness of proper safety measures to protect themselves from devastating effects of wildfire. Done this sixth day of May, 2021. Do we have anybody wishing to speak on this item? Yes, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and uh, members of the council. Barry Bierman, Deputy Fire Chief with North County Fire Authority. I just want to thank you on behalf of the department for recognizing the importance of wildfire preparedness um, and want to thank you as well for adding this uh, last minute agenda item uh, regarding my future or I guess the agenda I'll be discussing um, here later on in the um, meeting but it is very important and obviously wildfires are becoming more and more common in California um, and last year they hit pretty close to home so uh, we're very actively engaged in everything we can do and working with uh, the city, the council, the elected officials um, on, on, on securing funds and uh, informing the community, working with our partners in law enforcement to be as prepared as we can be uh, for these events that, that seem to be uh, more common than they've ever been. So thank you very much for taking the time to recognize this. Thank you, Barry. You've been a great help in this conversation. Um, moving on to item five, uh, oral communications number one. Are there members of the public wishing to speak on an item that is not on our agenda? Um, I have received no written correspondence. Let me check the attendees if there's any raised hands. I don't see any raised hands, Madam Mayor. Thanks, Ingrid. Um, Moving on to item six, the consent calendar. Can I get a first and a second to approve the consent calendar items C through F? So moved. Uh, 
I'll second, I'll second that. So. Okay, who's, who's the second? Go ahead, Colleen. Okay, I second. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lentz. Aye. Council Member Mackin. Aye. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Cunningham. Aye. Thank you. Item seven, old business. G, receive a mid-year budget report and consider adoption of resolution 2021-32, amending the annual budget for fiscal year 2020 2021 and making appropriations for the amount budgeted. Staff report, please. Yes, um, I've got a presentation. If, can I share the screen, Ingrid? Yes. So I'm here to present the mid-year budget update for 2021. And as part of this, I'll talk a little bit about 21, 22. And at the end, Carolina will talk about 22, 23 and beyond. When we did our budget projections for fiscal year 2021, we were unsure of what we were gonna do because we were just at the beginning of the COVID era or a COVID pandemic point in time. And so what we did in 2021 is we projected about $19 million for our revenues in 2021, and we projected about $20.4 million in revenues for 21-22. The expectations due to COVID, we had um, projected that our TOT would decrease by about $2.4 million over a normal year. We anticipated that sales tax would decrease about a million dollars. For property tax, we didn't uh, project any increases because we were unsure of what the pandemic might do to the collection of sales taxes or even how sales taxes were, or property taxes were gonna be impacted. And we also reduced parks and recreation fees by $300,000 because we knew that we weren't gonna be able to do as many programs as we normally did. On the expenditure side, we froze a number of positions. One of, we froze the code enforcement officer position. We delayed position requests and promotions that we were anticipating bringing forward to the city council at the beginning of 2021. And we did reduce parks and recreation programs based on the state guidelines that we had at that time. The reality of COVID is actually for TOT, it was worse than we thought. We actually are down about $2.5 million, not 2.4. So it's a little bit lower than we had anticipated. But sales tax, we had a million dollar increase over our normal time. So normally we would project about $6 million. We actually got sales tax, projecting sales tax close to $6.7 $7 million this year. There was for three big reasons. One is the Wayfair decision. The Wayfair decision was a a court decision that allowed sales tax to be collected based on where a uh, internet provider was based. We have a major internet internet provider based in town at this point in time, which is the Real Real, and they have provided a um, an increase in the amount of sales tax we got. Uh, also, a number of more people shopped from home. So from that perspective, if you don't have a location in California and you order stuff over the internet, it be, it's actually called, it's actually the use tax, not the sales tax that you pay. It's the same dollar amount. So you see no different as a taxpayer, but it's, a, it's collected differently and distributed differently. Use taxes are distributed to the county that they are collected in. And then they are distributed based on the proportion that the city is of the overall sales tax collected. So we became a larger portion of the county pool because a number of the cities had to close, had a lot of their brick and mortar places closed down. So whereas our sales tax went up, their sales tax went down. Normally we're 3% of the county pool, we became 5% of the county pool. So for all those reasons, we had an increase in our sales tax higher, much higher than we had anticipated. Also property tax, um, went up about $800,000. Uh, 
this past year from 20, 2021 is $800,000 more in the 1920s revenues. Uh, a little bit of it was due to the growth in citywide property tax. There was also a growth in our ERAF revenue. ERAF is the Education Relief Augmentation Fund. And what happens is back in 1992, the state was hurting for money and they had developed a method to take money from the cities by moving property tax from the cities into what they call the ERAF fund. And then what they would do is fund those school districts that needed state funding out of ERAF first, and then after that fund it out of the state revenues. Um, the rationale that they used for this was back in when Prop 13 was passed the, in 1978, um, and, and move forward a couple of years to 1982, the cities were hurting for money and the state in what they claim bailed out the cities by giving a portion of state property tax back to the cities. Um, so that's how they rationalized taking money back from the cities for ERAF. Uh, this, our county has a number of school districts that are locally funded. What they call basic aid is they're funded from their local property tax. And if a, if a school district is basic aid, then they don't need any money from the ERAF fund. So if there's more money in the ERAF fund than the school districts need, then that money goes back to the cities that generated that money. So we, there was more cities, more school districts became basic aid, less money was needed. So ERAF went up for us. Um, there's been a delay in the amount of VLF revenue that we are getting. Uh, the, in the infinite wisdom that the state had when they did the VLF swap, where they swapped the city's vehicle license fee for property tax, what they said is that you could get your property tax out of the ERAF fund. Because our ERAF fund doesn't have enough money, the city can't get its full amount of VLF. And this is an issue that um, we then go and ask the state for to reimburse us for the VLF that they, that they are withholding from us. Um, at last year, it was a, for the whole county, it was $10 million. This year for the whole county, it's about $90 million. Our portion is about $80,000 that we're not gonna see this year that hopefully the state will deem to give us in the future. Um, then the last one is that we had a growth in the successor agency property tax as you know, with all the growth out in Sierra Point, that is going into the assessed value, that's going into the property tax, and we get about 20% of that growth. So we've gotten growth in there. And the bulk of the $800,000 is actually coming from the Sierra Point. It was probably about $700,000 that we got in property, new property tax off of Sierra Point this year. And then finally, we had a reduction in parking recreation fees of about $370,000 for all the programs that we have not been able to put on. On the expenditure side, we froze the code enforcement position through June of 2021. As you know, there are a number of code enforcement issues that we are trying to deal with, and we do need that position back. It's, there's, it's one of those ones that um, is very necessary in our city. There are a number of planning issues, a number of police type issues where the code enforcement officer was very helpful for us, and not having that has made our ability to um, do all that work more difficult. It's being put on to our police officers at this point. So by bringing the code enforcement um, officer back, it will be very helpful. We um, postponed promotions through March of 2021. The promotions that we did in March uh, were the assistant city manager, the finance director, the parks and recreation director. And then I think in April, we did the deputy uh, public works director. So we postponed, we did postpone our uh, promotions through that period of time. We we're postponing new positions through the summer of 2021 and maybe a little bit later. And I'll get into what those positions are as I talk about fiscal year 21-22. And our savings from the Parks and Recreation Department was higher than we expected. We have about $470,000 worth of savings. That tells you about the large number of programs that we've, been, we've needed to cancel. Um, over, over this time, all of them that we've canceled is due to the restrictions put on us by the state. We didn't just re, re cancel programs because we wanted to, we were living within the state guidelines. 
Um, additionally, we had about $100,000 worth of COVID related expenditures. It's for additional cleaning that we need to do at the city facilities um, that we, you know, without COVID, we would not normally have done those uh, additional costs to allow remote work for employees. All of our, you know, a lot of our employees are working remotely and we need to provide them the infrastructure to do that. And then also uh, the federal and state have mandated leaves that we have to pay for and we're doing that. Um, we had one really major unanticipated and, and expenditure, which was the high-speed rail. We, I've reported to this to council previously. The cost was about $450,000 split between the city attorney's office and the community development department. So what does this mean for the ending fund balance? So for in 2019-2020, we had anticipated having an ending fund balance of eight, about $8.5 million. Fiscal year 1920 was much better than we had anticipated. We had a number of revenues that were up than more than we thought. And as always, we had some expenditures that did not happen. So we did not end fiscal year 2019, 2020 with eight and a half million dollars. We ended closer to $10.4 million. So it was a very, it was not 2019, 2020 turned out to be a good year for us. In 2020, 2021, we would have anticipated about $6.4 million, $6.5 million in ending fund balance. We are now reprojecting that to be about $9.7, $9.8 million in ending fund balance. A portion of that is because we've had higher revenues this year, and a portion of that is because we have a higher beginning fund balance. So working through the 2021 um, reserves or ending fund balance and what the reserve policy that the city council mm -hmm. has previously adopted. The council has adopted a uh, setting aside two and a half million dollars for a recession, uh, setting aside three and a half million dollars for unanticipated events, and then setting aside 5% of revenues in any given year and 5% of expenditures, which is about 2.2 million. So the total recommended mm -hmm. fund balance at the end of 2021 would be $8.2 million. We're anticipating about 9.7, 9.8 for a difference. And here it's to the dollar, and I can't guarantee that dollar amount, but the math had to work, of $1,568,052. So we do have, ending, we do have a, a additional ending fund balance. The city council also adopted a policy to how to use their ex excess reserves and what they had at that time, two years ago when we went through this process, said 20% would go towards capital projects, 40% would go be put into our OPEB trust. OPEB is our other post-employment benefits. Um, and I, usually when I talk about budgets, I talk a little bit about that. That's the benefits that employees would receive after they retire that aren't related to the pension. Uh, we are at this point in time, relatively well funded for that. We have enough money going on every year to put aside for that. We also have uh, money that the city council has previously put into the trust fund. And then we also have, city council also talked about putting 40% of into the pension trust, which would be another $627,000. Um, what staff would recommend this year is not to put the 40% aside for the OPEP nor the 40% aside for the pension trust. Um, there's uncertainty going forward, and I'll talk a little bit about 20, what 21, 22 is going to look like. But we do think it's a we do think that it's a you know, that 313,000 or about 300,000 dollars is available for capital projects this year. And in June, we'll be bringing you forward the capital project plan and make recommendations as to what kinds of projects City Council may want to look at using that 300,000, 313,000 dollars for. But when we bring back the project the CIP to you, the capital improvement plan, we bring back all the projects that have been talked about either by staff or by your various committees. Looking at fiscal year 21-22, at, at the beginning of, the, of COVID, we had projected about $20.9 million for revenues. At this point in time, um, we are projecting our property tax to be up slightly, but we're not projecting any change from 2021. We know that this, there might be some changes to this. There might be some growth in property tax. There may be some more money coming in from the zero point, but we also don't know what's going to be happening with the ERAF VLF. 
So to be conservative at this point in time, we're not projecting any property tax change. Um, hopefully at mid-year next year, Carolina can come to you and give you good news about that, that that was higher than projected, but we don't wanna uh, count our chickens before they hatch yet. On sales tax, we are actually reducing the uh, projection $700,000 from the 2021 revenue number. TOT, we're gonna increase it slightly to by 100,000. We're not quite sure how quickly the hotels are gonna come back online. Uh, we don't. We want to be as conservative as we can, so we know that we are able to afford what we're what we're recommending. And other revenues, we are projecting about a two hundred thousand dollar decrease. A good portion of this is because um, in twenty, in fiscal year 2020, 2021, we were still getting a lot of plan uh, plan check fees and building permits from Sierra Point. We know that that's going to slow down because all of the buildings are now being, const are being constructed. On the, on the expenditure side, we originally projected $24.1 million. We are now projecting that up by about one and a half million dollars. A million dollars of that is for the new personnel costs. As, we, as I said, we had the promotions of the ACM, the finance director, parks and recreation director, the deputy public works director, and then new positions that we know we need to bring online is we have a new person in for finance who needs to work on technology and projects for finance related issues. Um, one of the things that, we're, that we find as a finance department is that at, the more that we're able to do, the more people ask us to do, and we, we need to be able to provide those services to not only the citizens, but also to the organization as a whole to ensure that the financial stability of the city is maintained. We are also bringing online a full-time records assistant um, our, in the police department. We are bringing online the code enforcement officer. Uh, we are doing a study now on technology and the study is suggesting that we probably, that we need an additional IT support person. Um, generally back in 2000, when we did our initial IT study for the city, uh, what we did is, we were told that we had some hardware um, changes that we need to make that we did make, but we were also at that time suggested that we needed two full-time people to run our IT. Um, we were, we've gotten by with one IT person and some uh, extra time from a consultant. What we will probably need at this point in time is to have two full-time IT support and probably still have a little bit of additional time in consultant support. The other area is a new area for us, which is the geographic information system support. We anticipate that we need two people. The study is still going on, so we're not quite sure. Uh, at this point in time, uh, what the GIS does for us is give us the backbone, uh, the geographic backbone of the city. So whereas the financial system gives you all your financial information, the GIS is actually the rest of the city. And to have a very to be able to do building permits and to be able to do the uh, master planning for sewer, everything that we do is based on where things are located. And you need a robust geographic information system to be able to overlay all, everything that we're doing in the city. And additionally, the GIS system will probably be able to allow departments to talk better with each other and to allow us to better understand what's going on at each individual location and the departments will be able to get less siloed because right now every department has their own information that they keep about what's going on in a particular location. By having a robust GIS system, you're able to put all that together and you can better serve the public. And we'll talk about more of that as we get the IT and the GIS proposals, um, suggestions from our consultant. Having looked at the preliminary budget for the technology, uh, they're recommending at this point in time, and we haven't really taken a fine tooth comb. So this is what, what I would anticipate is a high estimate at this point in time is about $500,000 in uh, our backbone IT infrastructure. Uh, as you know, we have periodically have some um, server issues. We have some other types of issues that we deal with and we deal with them very quickly, but by improving the structure, we'll be able to reduce those. We're also going to be able to better serve the public because we're gonna have more stuff in the cloud. So we'll be able to be more of a 24 seven 
style city hall, which is I think what the citizens are now more looking for. Um, looking deeper at the property tax in 21-22, we, as I said, you know, we think that the assessed value for the successor agency passed through to the underlying tax entities are going to go up. We think we're going to get more money from the excess ERAF, but we also think we're going to get a decrease in our property tax in lieu of vehicle license fees. So at this point in time, we're not sure how all that's going to play out. So to be conservative, we're not projecting any increase in property tax. Uh, looking at sales tax, we have been told that the real real is leaving in August of 2021, which means that all that money that we got from them will not be available for us. Um, also, a portion of Amazon's Amazon sales will become situs based. So right now, Amazon sales are going into the county pools, but there are a number. There is an agreement that's that is going through the state process that is going to have Amazon be able to or require Amazon to declare their sales tax that they generate at their fulfillment centers. So there's gonna be a, a large amount of money coming out of the county pools. Um, just to let you know, an Amazon fulfillment center is somewhere in the neighborhood of 800,000 square feet. So, you know, those are, those are in places like in Tracy, I think is probably the big one at the moment, but they're also in Riverside County, in Riverside itself, and uh, places like that. Um, you know, and I know that, you know, our, our locations at this point in time aren't that large, so I'm not anticipating that we're going to see um, any situs space for us. We do get a little bit of situs space for Amazon Fresh, but that's not the same as having one of the large 800,000 square foot or a million square foot fulfillment centers. Um, and then as other agencies will recover, our sales tax revenues will be, re will be reduced and we'll get a smaller portion of the county pool. So the county pool will shrink because of, the Amaz because of what Amazon is doing and we'll, get a, we'll come back to the 3% share of it. So that's the reason why we're looking at a decrease in sales tax for next year. So in summary, we anticipate that revenues will be about $20.9 $20 million Expenditures will be about $24 million, and we're going to use about $3.1, $3.2 million of fund balance. Our anticipating fund balance will be $9,463,000. That is if the city council um, keeps the 80% um, in the fund balance and just uses the $313,000 for capital projects. And we would have an anticipated ending fund balance of $6.3 million. Uh, looking again at the city council's policy of two and a half million dollars for the recession reserves, uh, three and a half million dollars for unanticipated events, and the and the annual policy annual fluctuations of revenues and expenditures of two point two million dollars, our anticipating ending reserve of six point three will mean that our anticipated recession reserve will actually be five and about five hundred and fifty thousand dollars at the end of next year assuming all of my numbers are dead on accurate. Um, so what this is telling us is that the policies that the city council set aside money for, we're using them for those purposes. I mean, we're basically still coming through this COVID recession as a, as a state, as a country. We'll probably be coming out of this recession, will probably take us a couple of years. So using, you know, recession reserve and using a port, may, potentially a, uh, in the future, a portion of unanticipated events, that's exactly what you set the money aside for. Um, and that way we're still able to provide all of the services to the public. Um, you know, we're gonna bring back our recreation programs when we can, we're gonna be able to, you know, do better code enforcement going forward. We're gonna be able to provide better services to the community. Um, and so that's the ends, that, that ends what's gonna happen last year and what's happening this year and next year. And I'm going to turn it over to Carolina for what uh, what our thoughts are on on the future. Thank you, Stuart. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Um, so, as Stuart explained, uh, for fiscal year 21-22, uh, we're expecting to utilize our fund balance. Um, so, we're confident we'll be able to replenish over time. Obviously, the question becomes when. <laughs> so, we'll take it year by year. Um, but for 22-23, it's, uh, we can't say 22-23 will be the year uh, because there are several unknowns out there still. 
Um, so going through the list that we have presented, just a few examples. Uh, first, uh, we have the employee contracts that they're all targeted to expire June to 2022. And um, at least it frees the city to reevaluate re its offerings to the various employee groups and determine options to restructure the contracts and maybe find some savings there. Um, another area is the recovery of the hotel sector. Uh, with the large decrease in TOT, uh, it, a lot of it depends on the public's appetite for travel and on the return of conferences to San Francisco, which gives us a lot of, of uh, folks at our local hotels. Um, so that will can help contribute to the recovery of TOT. And for the sales tax, there, it, it's also reliant on public patterns, on the purchasing patterns. Um, but we've also seen that through COVID, it's remained healthy. Um, but for us, it will depend on if we can find a sales tax generating business that will be able to replace uh, the Bayshore building business um, or find whether it's Citus-based e-commerce um, or fulfillment centers, as we discussed. And so in Sierra Point, we do have continued construction and there are several buildings that are left to be built, but it's also the when that their assessment value uh, will be determined. So it, it's not only when they'll complete the, the construction, but it's when they actually assess those values that will determine uh, the property taxes that we will be seeing. So when they, they'll be assessed and for how much are the unknowns. For the long-term solution for ERAF and BLF, as Seward discussed, the county is actively pursuing retention of these revenues as our county is impacted by the school districts and the various status changes going throughout the county. The impact of PERS, the unfunded liabilities, uh, what we've seen is the state has projected a 7% uh, return on its investments. And we've seen through COVID, the markets have remained very strong, um, but we don't know going forward how the markets will, will react to just the uh, future changes of, you know, just in general. Um, and so although we know what our unfunded liability is through 21-22, after that, uh, we, it, it's unclear. So we'll have to be exploring different ways to reduce that cost or how to maintain it, um, how to impact it. And one of the areas is uh, finding other methods is using potential savings through things like the pension obligation bonds um, or looking how we could do prepayments of the liabilities for the, the, the PERS unfunded liabilities. And then the last item we have noted is the impact of the Brisbane real estate market. Uh, we saw through COVID that real estate was actually remained very active on the peninsula, um, but a lot of it is, you know, whether that's gonna die down or if it's gonna continue um, a lot, whether it's residential, commercial, that will have an impact on Brisbane and on, again, on the property tax assessments that we will be seeing in future years. So basically all, all of that is we have a variety of ways where we can see improvement in the coming years of our revenue streams. Um, yet it's the one that's too early to predict even for fiscal year 22-23. So with that, um, I'll return it over to Stuart. And that's the end of our presentation. If there are any questions, um, um, what we need you tonight to do is to approve the re adopt the resolution so we can amend the, um, the, the budget for the changes that are part of the resolution. All right, do we have any uh, council questions, Gustav? 
Yeah, I just got one question, Madam Mayor. Sure. Um, so, Stuart, uh, Carolina, thank you for the presentation. Um, you know, it's good to see that uh, the city's finances are are a lot healthier than what we were thinking they might be just a year ago. Um, you know, you see or you hear about, you know, the state being flush with, with money. I mean, granted, they have different revenue sources than us. And, um, you know, if, if hotels weren't hurting so bad, we would, <laughs> we'd have a lot of money. So, you know, the loss of the, the revenue from the hotels, you know, counterbalances, but still we're, we're, we're doing much better than anticipated. Um, so, but, you know, when you, you know, you have this new administration, there's this, this influx of, of, of money into people's pockets. There's the potential of this infrastructure bill happening. There just seems to be a lot of like enthusiasm. A, a lot of people are more positive about the future um, than perhaps where they were before. And, and people are feeling like the, you know, the pandemic is in the rear room mirror and, and better times are ahead. But there is a lot of caution from from both of you, and I, I'm just, you know, you, you just kind of just share a little bit more of, of that because you know the the budget is is one of the, the biggest things that the council has to, you know, be responsible for. Um, I think the caution from my perspective is that we have the ability to continue to provide the programs that we are providing. We are able to put money aside for some capital projects. Um, and until we recognize the revenues directly, it's hard for us to know exactly what we're going to get. You know, I'm, I'm not sure how quickly the TOT is going to come back. I mean, normally we would be $3.2 million. We're, you know, I'm hoping to get 700,000 this year. Um, the hundred thousand may be a little bit conservative next year, yeah, but I don't know. It, if it seemed very conservative, a hundred thousand, yeah. R right, but I mean, part of the challenge for us is the our major hotel in town is the Double Tree, and South San Francisco just opened a new Double Tree, and a lot of our they opened a new Double, new double Tree uh, near the Costco area. So they're going to be in conflict with each other. So I'm not quite sure, you know, you're going to stay in our double tree. Or you're going to stay in South San Francisco's double tree. Also, a lot of our hotel prior to COVID stays at the double tree where people who were overnighting that last night before they were flying back to China. I'm not sure how that international travel is going to pick up over the next calendar year. Um, so those are the kinds of things that, that I'm still cautious of. And I would rather be projecting on the low side at the beginning of the year and coming back to you at mid-year and saying, we have additional, additional money. As long as we're not a staff recommending that we don't, that we, as long as I'm not recommending we stop doing things that we need to do. It, it doesn't hurt us to wait six months or a year to make that, to say, here, here's, here's how it's better than we had thought, because we're not asking, we're not making any recommendations to not do anything at the moment. Um, the downside would be is if we become, if we come into you very optimistic and something else happens, if one of the COVID variants happens that it's, that it doesn't work, that it's able to get through the vaccines, if the federal government um, decides to go into complete gridlock because they can't get past a filibuster. Um, there, I agree with you, there's a lot of good signs out there. That's why I'm not concerned. I'm more concerned about us in the very short term, you know, one to two year period than, than I am in the three to five year period. And I think in three to five years, we'll see a lot of, a lot of these benefits that you're talking about happen for us. If that makes hopefully okay, that no, makes that, sense. That's, you know, that's that's really good. Thank you uh, for you know just providing a little bit deeper explanation of of your cautiousness and um, but you know potentially seeing that you know, you know um, greater growth if certain things happen. So thank you. Okay, are there any more questions from council? 
Stuart? No. I have a comment, if I could. Sure. Um, looking at a, a million dollars in new personnel costs and half a million in technology improvements when we have all of this in uncertainty makes me pretty nervous. And adding this many new employees and not paying anything into our pension obligations makes me even more nervous because this is, we've all heard about cities that ran into trouble by doing that. I, I would almost, I'm not gonna second guess the management of the city if these um, new staff members are required, but I'd almost rather see us tighten up in other areas and maybe the services that we normally provide, we cut back a little bit um, because we can't really anticipate what's going to happen with the economy. And I'd rather pay even at least half of that pension obligation than nothing right now. So um, I, would, I, would, I would agree with you. The challenge that we have though, is we do have a little over a million dollars in our pension trust fund separate from our PERS. So we are fully making our, re our required payments into PERS. Uh, Carolina later this year is going to be doing an analysis on whether or not we should do a pension obligation bond to pay our entire unfunded liability to PERS. The benefit of doing a pension obligation bond is right now we can borrow money at 3% or about 3%, 3 to 3.5%, and PERS is charging us 7% to carry the debt. So if we do the pension obligation bond, we'd be able to save money every year. We could put that what we save into our trust fund. The challenge though, of the pension trust fund is that it can only be used for pension purposes. Um, so what that means is that if we have money in the pension trust fund and we've paid off our unfunded, li uh, our unfunded liability through the pension obligation bond, it would be harder for us to get to use that money in the pension trust for other purposes. So putting money aside at this point, until we know exactly what we're gonna do with the pension obligation bond um, is not, you know, there's, there's other things that we can do. And that's, that was the rationale that we were thinking as to why we, weren't go, why we would suggest not putting money into the pension trust fund at this point in time. And for the uh, other pension, the OPEB, other pension employee, bene other post-employee benefits, I think Carolina, we have, about $3 million set aside in that yes. is what I think it is. And with yes. th that, that is, you know, considering that we are meeting all of our financial obligations for that, that $3 million is probably a dollar amount that um, we will not actually need to use for our current OPEB requirements. And that would probably be at some point in the future, be able to actually make our OPEB payment um, that we owe, as opposed to worrying about our unfunded liability. So I think in both of those cases, we are actually fairly well set at this point in time. And we will, you know, when we go through the pension obligation bond analysis for you, we'll bring that back in more depth as to what we're doing and why we're doing it and what we think we need to do in order to meet our obligations. And we'll be doing that um, sometime this calendar year. And, and I'd like to hear from Clay about the addition of all these new personnel, whether this is imperative to be done, especially if we're looking at contract renewals on existing employees in 2022. It just seems like we're taking on a lot all at once with an uncertain. So, sure. And, and I, I totally uh, appreciate that. Um, that's always the challenge that we have in these um, um these decisions um, in terms of, um, you know, staffing. So, you know, a couple of the areas are areas that we've had long-term uh, issues um, in, I think Stuart kind of identified, and we, we actually brought a consultant on to do, um, take a, a fresh look at our uh, information technology systems and platforms, as well as our um, GIS um, systems, um, or, or really kind of more in that case, more of lack of uh, systems. Um, so uh, these are long-term needs that we really need to get into um, over the next uh, few years. I think we're gonna be phasing into this. So it's not gonna be, 
you know, hiring people on July 1, um, it's going to be uh, probably in the case of uh, for the GIS people, particularly, it would, it would probably be a year from now before we'd actually hire them. I think the million dollar identification is, is what we anticipate um, at the cost as, you know, in the, in the future. Um, so we will be phasing into this. Um, we do have some other needs in terms of uh, the financial management systems um, and also in uh, communications that um, um, are pretty imperative that we get um, uh, addressed. Um, uh, you know, the finance people can kind of walk you through it, uh, at some point the, uh, all the uh, reporting requirements that they have that are uh, pretty extensive um, and how that's been growing over the last several years. Um, we've also seen that in our um, uh, public works area, our water uh, systems, our um, storm drain systems, um, things of that nature. There's just more and more state and federal reporting requirements that uh, are mandatory. So these things have been impacts on, uh, on staffing. We've tried to approach it, frankly, very systematically over the last um, few years, looking at uh, these things and trying to be fairly conservative in how we um, um, approach it. Um, uh, the, the issue with contracts, I mean, that's always going to be an issue that you're, you're going to be um, dealing with. I, I think it's, you just can't let one kind of halt the other um, from, um, from moving forward. Um, so I, I totally hear what you're saying. I think we're trying to balance the needs with the, um, with the, the you know, our financial um, situation. And uh, um, I think we're trying to do it in a very kind of cautious sort of way. Uh, so Again, the million dollars that Stewart's outlined, even the I think the half million in um, technology is not going to be all spent on you know starting January first, so or July first. So the, the the million dollars will probably be something fairly um, much less than that for the next fiscal year. That gives us another year to catch up um, before we start uh, seeing the, the total expenditure in that, which I wouldn't anticipate until probably sometime the following uh, fiscal year. Correct. Okay. And one of the things. Sorry, I, I no, apologize, I was, Colleen. I say we, have, we have quite a few consultants coming on board for a lot of different projects that are moving forward. And have we accounted for that in this expenditure projection? So a lot of the consultants that we have are for particular development projects and those are paid for by the developer. Um, and as Clay said, the million dollars, one of the ways that we budget is we budget every position in the city being filled from July 1st going going for the full year. So that way we can make sure we have the money available for that position. So a number of these positions will probably not be hired in the beginning as of July 1st. Um, you know, we haven't started recruiting for the finance position. We haven't started recruiting for the IT support position. We haven't started recruiting for the GIS positions. And as Clay said, the GIS may actually be a 22-23 issue. Because before we can really hire our GIS people and get a good GIS system in place, we need to have the IT backbone in place. So that million dollars is the high number that, we're, that we would project for what it would cost us for these positions. Um, so I, I agree that, you know, that we would, we'll probably could be coming back at mid-year and saying expenditures were not quite where we thought they, you know, again, were not quite as high as we had thought unless we have an unanticipated expenditure like we did for the railroad project this past year. I mean, that one, you know, at, you know, when we were projecting this in March of 2000, April of 2019, I have the right, yeah, I think I have the right year or, or 20, whatever that year, what, whatever it was, I can't, you know, COVID is such a long year. I can't remember. Or March of 2020, 2020. Um, we hadn't anticipated that the H the high speed rail was going to have, that expense for us to be able to respond to their EIR. And we absolutely did need to respond to that EIR and we have them and we had the money too. So, I mean, we, you know, for those kinds of things, we will find what we need to do and we'll come back to council to make the, you know, make recommendations if we need to change any of the other uh, programs that we thought we were going to be able to, to accomplish. Thank you. Okay. Um, Madison, Terry, do you have any questions? I do have a question. Thank you. Um, would it be prudent, Stuart, to um, 
well, I, I can understand not putting money into the OPEB um, reserves if we're going to be refinancing and needing to, those to be larger to make it worth our while. But I would rather see less going into new capital projects um, when we're taking so much out of our recession reserve and getting really close to our our basic, uh, you know, what we have to have left over in our budget. So right. that's just my comments. And, and I think, you know, when we bring back the capital projects in June, that could be a decision that the city council wants to make based on the projects that are brought forward as to which ones you might want to wait a year for or wait until mid-year happens next year to see if, you know, that by, that if what we've projected isn't what actually happened, if we're better off than we were. So if you want to do that, I think that might be one of those ways that we can do that. I would agree with you, Terry. Madison, do you have any questions? No. Um, I have a clarifying question, Stuart, for the um, education of the general public. Could you just explain, and I know part of this was the EIR response to high-speed rail, could you explain the $450,000 relative to high-speed rail, just so the public is aware of what that means, please? Sure, um, I'll do the best I can, and I'm gonna hope that John and, and Clay can jump in for that, which I don't know. But when the high-speed rail presented its environmental impact report, we needed to respond to that to put all of our issues out on the table. So that way they had to respond to us from their, from when they went from their draft report to their final report. And then if we need to take further action on their EIR, we needed to have all of our issues brought forward. Um, and it took a tremendous amount of specialized um, consultant time to be able to go through the very large EIR for the high-speed rail because um, what they're looking at doing is putting a maintenance a maintenance yard on the Baylands, which is going to have a major impact on the city. From a yeah, they they made their presentation to city council. It was it was shown. I mean, they're talking about bringing their train up over um, the current configuration at a at a. I think was a 60 foot level, which would then make anything else that would have to go over that even higher. Um, that it would be a, a rail yard that would operate in the evening time. So there would be a noise impact on Brisbane constantly in the evenings. So we wanted to make sure that we were able to put the best case forward as to all the issues that we, that we know about as part of the EIR process. So if we need to raise them later, they are part of the record. Great, thank you. I think that was really valuable for our community to hear. Okay, um, Ingrid, is there anybody from the public who'd like to ask a question or comment on this? I have a question from Prem Lal. If city consultants will be paid for by the developer, it seems rather doubtful that the consultancy they would provide could be unbiased. Rather, it is more likely that their advice will reflect the agenda of the developer. I just want to be clear here that, that this, these are contractors, that the city hires, the city pays, and then we have reimbursement agreements with applicants. So they are completely under the control of the city. Thanks, Clyde. Any, anybody else, Ingrid? I have no written correspondence received and I have no hands raised, Madam Mayor. Okay, thanks. So council discussion, what is your pleasure? Uh, I'll make a motion to consider uh, adoption of resolution 2021-32, amending the annual budget for fiscal year 2020 and making appropriations for the amounts budgeted. I have a second. Okay. I'll second. Uh, second from Madison Davis. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lance. Aye. Council Member Mackin. 
Aye. Councilmember O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Cunningham? Aye. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, moving forward to item eight, new business. H, item H, consider initiating a request for proposal to develop a citywide affordable housing strategic plan. Staff report, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Honorable Mayor, members of the council. As you're well aware, since the redevelopment agencies were dissolved by the state several years ago, cities in California, including Brisbane, lost a key funding source for the development and administration of affordable housing and other housing assistance programs. The city's uh, funds were kind of a carryover from what, what uh, we collected during redevelopment time, as well as um, some one-off funds that were generated through sale of, of uh, properties, but we don't have any sort of ongoing um, funding source for future affordable housing uh, activity. Um, so while we have this limited constraint, we all are aware that the development of housing in California and particularly affordable housing is a key state priority. And there's a lot of pressure on local jurisdictions you know, through RENA and other means to, to not only plan for housing, but also facilitate its production ultimately. So we have that sort of demand, even though we have limited resources. And then we have the Baylands, which provides an opportunity potentially for, for um, scale of affordable housing that are really unavailable anywhere else in the remainder of Brisbane. So, so we have this sort of constraints, we have obligations and we have opportunities, and yet we have no proactive affordable housing programs or priorities to address these particular obligations and opportunities. So some discussions with the uh, housing subcommittee, council members Davis and Lentz, uh, discussing the need for the city to comprehensively and proactively manage our affordable housing obligations and explore our opportunities. And the recommendation that the city seek out a qualified consultant to develop an affordable housing strategic plan. And some of the components that, you know, obviously this would be fleshed out, but some of the things we envision at this point is identifying short and long-term city management responsibilities associated with existing and future legally restricted affordable housing and exploring options for administering those duties. Another task would be to identify and evaluate programmatic and project options for utilizing the city's current fund balance, as well as any future funds that may accrue. Um, third is to specifically review and develop affordable housing strategies for the Baylands. And again, the idea of doing that proactively early on, not, not go through an entitlement process with the Baylands and then try to shoehorn affordable housing after the fact or later. And then last, uh, look at uh, options to uh, maintain and uh, actually increase the revenue stream for low mod housing over time. There are opportunities and funding sources that are out there. And I think part of this uh, effort should, should explore those and see if those are things the, the city uh, in, is interested in entertaining. So if the council's willing to proceed along this path, um, we prepare an RFP in consultation with the housing subcommittee. The subcommittee would be involved in consultant selection and ultimately make a recommendation to the full council as to the selection of a, a qualified consultant. So with that, staff's recommending the city council authorize the city manager to prepare and release an RFP to qualified consultants for the affordable housing strategic plan and authorize the housing subcommittee to make a recommendation for consultant selection to the council. That concludes my comments. Thank you, John. Uh, council questions? Colleen. Um, I, I just, it's a question and a comment, John, for the public watching. Colleen, can you speak up just a little, please? Sure. For Thank the you. public watching, John, could you please just um, explain who, who will actually be paying for this consultant? That was in the staff report, and I think that in following where we say developers are paying for consultants, this is this is relevant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's a good point. Um, since uh, much of the work would be directly related to the Baylands, um, as city managers pointed out, we do have a reimbursement agreement with that developer developer to pay for consultant services associated with their project. Portion of this could be would be subject to uh, reimbursement by them. Um, also, the, house, the affordable housing fund 
they do allow for administrative costs. So I think this would be an eligible administrative uh, cost through the housing fund as well. So it wouldn't be a general fund impact at all. Thank you. And I, I just want to say, I think this is a really good proactive thing because it's one thing to build housing. We're all under a microscope from Sacramento. It's another thing to start actually building affordable units from our arena allocation. And it's something, it, it, it's a big bonus if we work ahead on this. Thank you. Terry, Madison, Cliff, Terry. Uh, I guess I'm missing it. Where do you anticipate the cost? I understand you're saying we'll get reimbursed. Um, not from, the, you know, it won't come out of the general fund. But where do we see what this consultant is anticipated to cost? We won't know that until we go through the RFP and selection process. Um, I didn't want to put a dollar amount because we didn't have the opportunity really to, um, to pre-cost it. We wanted to get the authorization, but certainly that fund amount will be fully available and part of the consultant selection process, including value, right? I mean, that would be one of the considerations we look at in selecting a consultant is the, the value for the, the cost and the product. And, and what kind of, when you're saying that, you know, a good amount of the affordable housing would be based in the Baylands so they'd Oh, a portion of it, we don't have an idea of what proportion that would be. So is there an idea of what proportion that would be? I'm sorry, proportion of the amount of housing? The total contract. Um, I mean, we'd have to see again the proposal, right? And each task would have a defined budget and scope. So to the extent that there are costs with the scope that are attributed and apply to the Baylands, for example, administration of a future housing program. Well, that's gonna to touch the Baylands. So that could be um, attributed to the Baylands. Certainly a housing strategy for the Baylands is very directly related to the Baylands. Uh, funding options could be applicable to the Baylands as well. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot of applicability of the reimbursement um, strategy approach the city uses to, to obtain the consultant services we need to, to get this job done. I'd love to hear what the housing subcommittee thoughts are, but thank you. Thanks. Madison, Cliff? Uh, you know, I, I, if I can follow with a question first to John. So, um, you know, when you look at the the amount of, of affordable units that could be built in Brisbane, you know, of course, the Baylands, you would just assume would 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 create the greatest opportunity. Um, you know, our town, you know, the rest of the town is, is you know, fairly small. So, um based upon just kind of like that acknowledgement, a, a good portion, you know, I know you don't have the, you know, the exact, you know, percentage, but a, a fairly healthy percentage of, of the, of the overall cost for the consultant is going to be reimbursed by uh, BDI. Okay. All right. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I think, uh, staff in, in the report itself, you know, really explain why it's so important for us to have um, a consultant on board um, to help us understand what is the best strategy to create affordable housing um, in our community. Um, you know, you, you, you can build housing and, you know, that, that, that serves a, a certain need, you know, usually it's market value, but it's, it is difficult. To, to build the, the affordable units. And, 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 but by having a consultant on board, uh, that allows us to, to put forth a, a sound strategy to, to find you know, revenue sources that we can partner with. Um, and 
in, in, in really make, uh, make a difference. Um, you know, BDI is going to, you know, put forth their, their kind of strategy for creating affordable housing units. And it might be a good strategy, but, you know, maybe it doesn't really hit the mark how we want to see it. And by having that consultant, they can provide alternatives for us as a council then to, to make the best decision uh, for our, our community. So I, I think it'd be money well spent. I think okay. also like it puts us in a better uh, negotiation you know, position to have somebody on our team who really understands affordable housing. Um, I think that they can help us know like what mix of housing uh, will cause what phenomena to occur um, and what, you know, what choices lead to what outcomes. And I think that that's really important as we're negotiating, you know, housing and the mix of housing to have somebody who's on our team who can help us navigate that um, in the best way possible. It's the same reason why we have McCool from MIG, right? Like he's, he's well-versed in urban planning and he can tell us what's possible. Um, and sometimes it might be contrary to what the developer says is possible. And so having that teammate, um, I think, helps us better negotiate. Uh, the other thing, too, is that we have money in our affordable housing. You know, we have affordable housing funds. And I think that if we already have this person on our team who's predominantly working on the balance, we can also pull them in for other things as we're trying to determine hey, what's the best use of this money? And uh, I think that they could help us make more informed decisions, whether we want to, you know, build a, um, a project or whether we want to fund, you know, zero interest loans for first time home buyers, that sort of thing. Um, also, they could help us if there's a site that we might be considering purchasing for low income housing, they would be great to be able to tell us, you know, what they think the density on something like that would need to be um, in order, you know, to have as much low income housing as possible, or if they felt that that site is feasible to accomplish low income housing. So, you know, having that person who's well versed in that uh, field, I think it's just going to help us make more informed decisions and put taxpayer money to the best use possible. Are there any other uh, council questions? Let's see, nobody. Um, Ingrid, do we have any public comment or questions, please? I have not received any written correspondence or text messages. Um, I see one hand up, let's see. Oh, nope. No, they put their hand down. Okay. All right. Um, council discussion. Okay. No discussion. Does somebody want to make? Um... No, no. <laughs> I'll make a motion to move forward um, with uh, uh, the process to um, see. More to initiating a request for proposal to develop the citywide affordable housing strategic plan. I guess okay, yeah. I mean, I guess that that that's what it says here. But I mean, it, we're moving forward with the consultant. But I guess if if that's the motion, then um, that that works for that. That's that's the item up for. Yeah, that's the way it's yeah, that's the way it's worded. But <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Okay, I'll go with that. Okay. So it sounds like you made a motion, uh, Madam Mayor. So I'll, I'll I'll second that. Okay. All right. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Davis. Aye. Councilmember Lentz. Aye. Councilmember Mackin. Aye. Councilmember O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Cunningham. Aye. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, it says item P. I'll go with that. Um, to consider the approval of resolution numbers 2021-32, 2021-33, 
and 2021-34 of the City Council of the City of Brisbane for funding from the Forest Health Grant Program as provided through California Climate Investments. Staff report, please. Yes, good evening again, Barry Bierman with North County Fire Authority. Um, in an effort to enhance the safety within the city of Brisbane through grant funding for community vegetation, fuel reduction and community outreach and education, um, the governor and the legislature has approved $530 million to be awarded um, in grants that will be going through CAL FIRE um, and awarded from CAL FIRE this year. And we are putting in for three separate grants to assist in the wildfire preparedness that, um, again, thank you for recognizing the month of May, this kind of coincides with that. Um, the three separate grants that we're gonna be putting in for, would like to put in for with your approval of a resolution um, is we're gonna put in for $150,000 to uh, modify the roadway egress and ingress vegetation uh, through the city, starting with the main thoroughfare roads and working out to uh, all of the side streets. Um, a lot of people in the time of evacuation um, can become overrun at times uh, through a rapidly advancing fire on the streets and uh, in the cars that, that are trying to get out. So we wanna open that up right away in the event of a wildfire. Um, we're asking for $100,000 in grant funding for public education and community outreach. Um, and that's our second grant. And then the last grant is we've been working for uh, quite a few years now on about 1200 feet of that fuel break at the back of, off of Trinity Road at the base of the San Bruno Mountains. And we have uh, developed a plan to continue that and further along the entire uh, back of the city uh, that butts up against um, San Bruno Mountain. And we're asking for $700,000 from the state to help fund that as well. Um, we There is some administrative costs that are with these grants that would allow us the opportunity to uh, work on hiring someone to, to help uh, administer these grants and, and run them. This takes quite a bit of work if these are awarded. And um, that's probably one of the ways we would, we would get someone to try to help manage this as uh, I talked to Randy and, and Public Works and, and both his shop and the, and the fire. Um, our shop is, is, is fairly inundated right now with projects. So there's a funding source to help us uh, through these grant projects. And if awarded to the city, uh, there would be no cost out of pocket to the city. There is no in-kind matches for this. Um, it would just be awarded. There's uh, several years we'd have to complete these projects. And these projects would definitely uh, continue to enhance the wildfire preparedness um, that we've been working on uh, through Zone Haven and the projects that we've already started our weed abatement um, ordinance. And I think it would be a, a very good um, funding source to, to get additional work done. And a report. Thank you. Okay, council questions. Terry. When are these grants due? So the application for the grants are due on May 19th, which is uh, why we ask that they be brought on tonight um, because you must have signed resolutions um, to accompany each grant application. They are looking to uh, make a decision in July on who will be awarded these grants. It's a lot of money. There'll be a lot of uh, cities and jurisdictions putting in for it. And then the um, signed agreements and funding will probably start in November. So this does not um, help us in the uh, very short term for the future. And we are um, actually looking at additional grant that we uh, hope to be funded um, through the Coastal Conservancy, and that would be happening much sooner. And you will be seeing another staff report in the very near future for, for that funding um, to take care of the short-term issues. But this is something that will allow us to start working through next winter and being prepared for the next uh, few summers ahead. Okay, any more questions? I see no more questions for you, Barry. So, um, any public comment, Ingrid? Prem Lal had asked um, that regarding, um, had asked where Ida P was in the agenda, and I had informed, and uh, I had informed him that we had added this 
at the beginning of the meeting on the grounds that the agenda was posted, um, but on the grounds that the matter arose after the agenda was posted and action on the item was needed before the city council met again. Okay, did he have any further questions or response uh, to that? No, no other questions. We did consider this as, as an urgent matter, so thank you. Okay, any other public comments? None? There are none, thank you. Okay, council discussion, please. I just have one question. Um, since the delay in you know, starting of work or using the grants, if we're awarded them, would take some time and you know go into next winter. That would give time for, I unfortunately did not have an opportunity to read these um, resolutions um, in their entirety before the meeting. And that's my problem, but um, it would give time to make sure that they are consistent with the habitat protection area and that we wouldn't be just willy-nilly chopping down everything growing in our town. Yes, I, I've been in communications with uh, Randy and it will definitely be a collaborative effort on identifying the areas on um, that you know the roadways, et cetera, um, and continuing that uh, fuel break. We we have already worked very closely with the uh, county parks and 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 through the different uh, groups that are involved in the sensitive habitat, the, the you know the butterfly habitat, some of the same stuff we talked about for um, the ordinance that was passed a few weeks ago. So yeah, it will be you know it's not going in there and, and clear cutting by any means, but it's definitely mm -hmm. you know a shaded fuel break type on the backside of San Bruno Mountain, tall. Um, uh, heritage trees or tr trees that are you know healthy will be left in place and limbed up and it'll be a continuation of the current 1200 um, foot line we do every year and um, but no it will not just be a go in there and cut and swath it, it will be you know, we'll have to do community outreach when we start trying to open up roadways or clear back some roadways and, and make sure that we are um, you know, trying to, to do the best we can to uh, you know, <coughs> take care of the community and, and the fire concerns. Great thank you. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Colleen, you're off my screen. So, do you have any? No, I, I, I would thank Chief Myers and Deputy Chief Bierman for doing the work to seek um, the funding from these grants. Thank awesome. you. Okay, so what is Council's pleasure? Can I get a first and second approving, initiating a request? Oh, sorry. Okay. Can I, yes. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2021 32, 2021 33, and 2001 34. Thank you, Terry. Do we have a second? Second. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Davis? Aye. Councilmember Lentz? Aye. Councilmember Mackin? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Cunningham? Aye. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks. Thank yes. Thanks. Thanks, Chief and Deputy Chief. Thank you very much for getting it on tonight. We appreciate it. Yeah, we do too. Thank you. Um, okay, moving on to item nine, which is the workshop. I, an overview of utility scale battery storage, technical and regulatory issues, and poten potential community benefits staff report, please. Oh, yes. Thank you, uh, Honorable Mayor, members of the council. The city has received uh, several requests recently from private parties who are interested in developing utility scale battery storage facilities on private property in Brisbane. This is a very, uh, very recent phenomena. Uh, we don't have any experience that in a regulatory standpoint or a land use standpoint. Um, understand that battery storage is kind of a pretty important component of the larger grids uh, functionality and utility, as well as to help um, sort of uh, utilize uh, renewable uh, energy to a more uh, effective degree or uh, extensive degree. Um, so there's kind of the overall need for additional storage 
And then apparently Brisbane's proximity to um, the Martin substation is a factor which seems to be driving interest in sites within Brisbane. So the purpose of tonight's workshop is really to provide the community and the council with a sort of an overview of this kind of new, new business and how it fits into the grid and what its potential regulatory and, and uh, other issues related to it are and um, to help sort of context for everybody in, in case we do get future applications that move forward for these kind of facilities. So the workshop is gonna be presented by the integral group, integral group who are the city's uh, sustainability consultants for the Baylands. They're also uh, involved in preparation of the sustainability framework that the council adopted several years ago. So with that, I'm gonna turn the presentation over to the team at integral. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and City Council. It's a pleasure to be back to talk to you. Um, I'm Andrea Traber. I'm with Integral Group. I did work with you on your sustainability framework and that was wonderful. Um, I'm here tonight with my colleague, Sam Brooks, uh, who leads our advanced energy practice and with lots of experience in the renewables world for quite a while. Um, this is, I just want you to know, this is a, this is a topic that is, has a lot of interest everywhere because it's um, because of all of our climate goals and so on. And so this is real. And I applaud the city taking the time to really understand this is a very important topic. So with that, Sam will be presenting and uh, we should have plenty of time um, to present and then questions uh, that you may have, so. Take it away, Sam. You may be on mute. Yes. <laughs> Gosh, amateur hour here. Uh, we've been at this a year. Uh, Sam Brooks, uh, uh, a recent um, transplant to the Bay Area. Um, so good to be here with everybody tonight. Um, yeah. We're, Really look forward to a discussion. Um, to the extent uh, you, you all have questions, please jump in. Um, if something um, surfaces, uh, we've got about 20 slides here and um, uh, here we go. Uh, I think it's important um, to contextualize uh, these things. We've been at this a very long time. Uh, the transmission of power uh, about 125 years ago was when, um, when this part of the world uh, first thought about uh, the transmission of power from uh, long range and, and how to balance supply demand. It was the Folsom power plant uh, northeast of Sacramento uh, that, that about 125 years ago started sending power uh, to the Bay. Um, and so, you know, it's, a, it's an old legacy system uh, that's complex, um, but it's old. Um, and so these things we're talking about are a big deal because uh, they're unwinding and recalibrating a system that's been... Um, that's been operating for quite a while. This gives you a sense of what we're talking about tonight. This is, um, this is the country's largest battery project. Um, this is in Texas. Uh, Tesla is the vendor on this. Tesla's kind of the, one of the, the major players here. Uh, this is 100 megawatts. Um, and so you can see there each, each battery uh, is about the size of a shipping container. Um, and so uh, it gives you a sense of scale. Hopefully everybody can see the, the cars and the, and the trucks and, and contextualize um, what the size is. And this is about the size of a very large uh, utility scale project. And that's a, this is roughly the size or bigger uh, of the ones um, that, that might be in consideration here in Brisbane. Um, the, not all battery storage is created equally. Um, so I, it's important to be very clear about what we're talking about. Um, there's battery storage that's sited at power plants, battery storage that's sited between the plants and buildings uh, in the transmission and distribution grid. Um, and then there's battery storage sited on the other side of the meter, um, you know, most notably and kind of everybody's starting to get to know, uh, you know, the, the battery storage that you'd have in your home. Um, so the one we're talking about uh, tonight is, is this one, um, which is uh, in the tr transmission distribution grid. Um, and that's, that's where this uh, utility scale storage uh, lives. Um, to further just 
paint the picture again uh, of what we're talking about in terms of scale. Uh, the amount of battery storage in a basic electric car, um, you don't, you'd need about a quarter of one for your home. Uh, one megawatt would be uh, about 30 of those. Uh, this is one tenth of this Tesla in installation I showed earlier. Um, that's, that's how many electric cars um, the battery storage and scale of that is. So uh, this, this, is a, this is a big deal with, um, with big scale. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, that you know, has a big impact, costs a lot of money. Um, and this is a kind of interesting way to, to get a sense of what we're talking about there. Um, we are talking about lithium ion. There are multiple technologies uh, for battery storage. Um, and, and we could have spent the, the hour or this evening on those, uh, but it is, it is notable and, 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 and there's a reason we're talking about lithium ion because it is the, the dominant player in the market. It's the most arguably mature technology, the most cost effective at this point. Um, and so um, there are others, uh, we'll get into it in a little bit, um, some advances that, that would be uh, helpful to this part of, of the energy universe, but um, at this juncture, uh, lithium ion is kind of the name of the game, and, and, and it would be more than likely that, that any uh, thing that would come before the city would be uh, lithium ion in nature. Uh, the basics here, again, about a shipping container size uh, for a megawatt, and so just multiply that uh, up. Um, sound about a vacuum cleaner. This isn't that noisy. Um, it's huge uh, to look at that installation in Texas, but, um, but it does not have uh, a huge impact just in, in terms of um, impact on uh, residents that, would, that it might be near our businesses. Um, to be clear, uh, when you talk about the lifespan of a, a battery storage installation, this is an industry that hasn't been around all that long. Uh, so um, while the technology has been there, the, the sale scale um, that we're seeing here, uh, the, the truth of the matter is we don't have a lot of data about how long these things last and, and, and how they're decommissioned. Um, the, the sense is, uh, and a pretty good sense that a couple of decades is, is about the life expectancy and, and might stretch to 25 or 30, um, the decommissioning. Uh, process is one that, um, again, uh, there just aren't a lot of 100 megawatt battery storage installations out there that are that are even five years old. So, um, but uh, this is something that that the industry understands, and I think somewhat um, it should be some significant confidence that the ability to decommission and handle uh, the waste ultimately is something that the industry would be able to do. Um, the materials are uh, flammable. Uh, this is sometimes, uh, you know, it, it gets headlines when a when an electric vehicle, uh, you know, catches fire. It certainly happens, uh, but and in, in the grand scheme of things, this is a risk that's not very high. Um, and it's always important to recognize what you're replacing. Uh, a lot of times, as I'm going to go into, you're replacing power plants with these batteries. Uh, and power plants aren't all that safe either um, at the extreme. So um, you know, you can you can burn fuel. Uh, and combustion, um, or you can have a battery storage installation. And so um, uh, there are risks, but, uh, but there are risks that are well understood and, and ultimately not all that significant. Um, the marketplace for battery storage, um, we're looking at the, at the right side, at the bottom right side uh, of this um, slide here. So we're, we're in a so-called IOU. Um, and looking at utility supply or non-residential supply. So this is, this is the part of market that's the most robust. Uh, you see, certainly a lot of activity in the residential uh, space and you know, particularly uh, in this part of the world uh, with the you know, increasing uh, power safety uh, shutoff events. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot more residents um, that are that are putting battery storage in their homes, often tied to to solar panels on the roof. Uh, but the non-residential and utility scale um, is still the major driver here. And so uh, we're talking about something that, while there, this is relatively new, this is the part um, of of the market that's that is really robust. Um, 
the benefits uh, which I'm gonna work through, uh, they're, they're, they're many, they're complicated and, and hopefully we'll get to, um, to a spot where we're hopefully uh, can clearly understand uh, who's benefiting, what the benefits are, what the risks are. Uh, one way to look at it is you have uh, in the middle there uh, different uh, beneficiaries of the battery. Uh, the, the beneficiaries can be um, the grid owner and the grid system itself. Um, so, you know, both just in terms of operations can benefit that. It can also benefit uh, because you don't have to buy and replace that extremely old uh, aging infrastructure. Um, again, going back to that, um, that previous slide, you can also cite these things at the power plant and the power plants now are often solar and wind. Uh, that's another potential beneficiary uh, of utility scale storage. And then mini grids, micro grids um, is, is kind of the other side of the meter. Um, and so those beneficiaries are obvious when you have uh, solar in your home uh, and battery storage in your home, um, you, you very clearly benefit uh, from, from that asset. Um, you can't do a battery storage uh, presentation without showing this. Um, it's kind of like a contractual obligation if you're in the industry. So um, here is the duck curve. Um, if, if anybody has... Um, any familiarity with, the, with what has happened in California, this is often um, the thing that um, folks point to. This, is, this helps describe uh, the problem of what's happening um, with all of the solar. It's a good problem to have, but um, there's a ton of solar and what's happening is there's um, almost too much at parts of the day. Um, and that's creating some problems. And so another way of looking at, at the duck curve and there's a lot going on on this slide, so I'll leave it here for a moment. Um, but there in the middle, um, there's there's a lot of a lot of solar, and, and so here you, you want to charge some of that solar and push it to uh, both the beginning of the day, but particularly the end of the day. And you can see in that dotted line that's uh, green or gray, um, prices really spike um, in, in the kind of five six o'clock hour, uh, and that's because the sun's going down, the solar power uh, is starting to ramp down and to provide the, the power in that, in that ramp up period um, where, the, where you can see the duck um, really start to show, that's the expensive part and that's where the battery storage finds lots uh, of its value um, is right there. Um, and, and notably, it's a, kind of keep going back to your a little bit, there's a clear correlation between cost and carbon. And so as the solar, um, you know, generation starts to wind down and the natural gas plants start to wind up, uh, costs start to go up and carbon emissions start to go up. Um, and, you know, the, the basic reason why it gets more expensive is you have to pay for the natural gas. The marginal expense for that solar power is um, just the bright thing in the sky. As long as it's shining, um, you know, you're able to produce that power. So, um, you know, when, when we talk about decarbonization, you're often also talking about uh, reducing financial uh, impact as well. So um, I'm going to look at uh, the benefits here in, in kind of four places, uh, carbon cost, reliability, and, and environmental justice. Um, looking at these two in two ways is, is important, and I think um, it, it is easy to uh, conflate the benefits um, for utility scale and then what happens um, behind the meter. And so here we'll look at it um, side by side just to, to show the benefits. A lot of them are shared. Um, as you'll see, the peaking, you know, it really does in many respects come down uh, to, to finding ways to reduce that um, peak power consumption and meet that peak power consumption uh, late in the day. Um, as the solar power again is is, is rolling off and uh, folks are coming home and, and turning things on and um, and that's that's where you see um, you know a, a big big part of need for this battery storage um, and so you know if you can get rid of uh, those peaking plants you reduce carbon emissions uh, on the one side of the meter the other thing that happens is during a grid outage um, you more times than not. Um, diesel generators are used to provide power. Those have carbon emissions. And so uh, when you're able to, to get rid of diesel, uh, also able to reduce uh, carbon emissions as well. 
cost being the major driver, again, very correlated with carbon. So it's the same, going to reduce the need for these peaking power plants. Um, so, you know, they, they produce carbon and they cost money. Um, and so, um, you know, reduce the need there, a uh, big benefit to the grid. Uh, infrastructure uh, related, you know, that, that aging 125 year old system um, needs new transformers and substations and, and power lines. Um, and so battery storage can help mitigate uh, the need to replace those. Uh, another thing that's happening um, is that when the solar power exceeds the demand, which is now happening in California, which is something that was inconceivable uh, even a decade ago, um, it's, uh, but what's happening is you've got that free power and we're not able to use it. Um, and so when the term curtailment means we're literally shutting plants down uh, because we don't have any place to put the power. Uh, so obvious, uh, you know, a loss of financial benefit if you're not using what is essentially free power. Um, and so battery storage can help deal with that. Uh, resource adequacy uh, is a very uh, complex issue. Um, it's something that uh, that I could spend the next 30 minutes and probably would still uh, struggle to describe clearly, uh, but uh, it's related to the peaking capacity. Ultimately, everything comes back to the fact that balancing supply and demand is, is kind of the central and obvious role of a power grid. Um, and so there are various mechanisms that the grid uses to incentivize um, assets being deployed in the grid. They can be power plants, they can also be diesel generators has been um, a, is something that's happened that's a smaller scale uh, across the country. Now battery storage is becoming a major player there. And so KISO is the grid in California um, and is now looking, um, particularly after last summer's uh, power outages uh, in particular is, is now um, uh, is charged to find ways to increase the incentives. Um, also might even happen behind the meter. And the behind the meter financial benefit is ultimately boiled down to pretty simple. Uh, you know, when the, when the power rates are, uh, are low, you wanna charge and when the power rates are high, you wanna discharge and not, not have to use power from the grid. Um, so that's what's going on there. The reliability part is I think the, the part that's easily overlooked and very easily conflated. Uh, there are power outages for effectively two reasons. One is, uh, there are wildfires and in, in, in California, there, there are events. Uh, power lines can go down for extreme, uh, you know, uh, extreme wind and, and rain events. But here in California, it is the um, it is the the electric grid that is um, causing wildfires a lot of the time. And so we're shutting that grid down in order to improve safety. Um, that is one reason uh, why the power goes out. The battery storage at a utility scale doesn't help that. Uh, in broad strokes, it doesn't help that. What it does do is it helps um, with supply and demand imbalances. That's the other reason why the power goes out. Last summer, uh, when particularly hot spell, uh, the power went out uh, and rolling blackouts because uh, we were unable to match demand and supply. Um, and battery storage can play a role grid-wide to, to deal with that. Uh, so it can improve reliability, but the vast majority of outage events happen because of that physical problem, which is that the wires and poles and wires and that electric grid um, is either physically down or has to be shut off um, for safety reasons. And when it is, uh, a, a, a battery storage installation, no matter how big, is now a part of a system that has to be shut down. Um, and so, uh, in, again, in broad strokes, it, it it is unable to really help um, and benefit a community like Brisbane, even if located seemingly proximate, uh, you know, geographically proximate, still has trouble uh, producing actual reliability um, and backup power during those events. A microgrid behind the meter, which could be in your home or could be at a great scale, like a new real estate development project, that's different. And so when it's sited behind the meter, so-called, on the side of the buildings and the homes, uh, that battery storage installation can provide uh, backup uh, capabilities during any outage event. Um, that's usually what's thought of with battery storage at scale, is that ability to provide backup power when, when the lights go out. 
um, and it works behind the meter. Uh, but again, really important to distinguish uh, these things. Uh, front of the meter uh, really doesn't uh, impact the events that, that we've gotten so used to in the Bay Area. Um, uh, local emissions, there's carbon emissions, and then there are emissions that are air pollutants from um, that, that cause localized and immediate health impact. Um, those can come from power plants and those peaking power plants, again, continuing to go back to that. Um, it provides carbon benefits, it provides cost benefits. There's natural gas plants also provide, uh, create and emit um, very harmful uh, pollutants that, um, that are good for us. Uh, and the thing is, is that power plants are typically cited, um, you know, in low income and communities of color. And so when we're getting rid of those peaking plants or reducing the need to build new ones, uh, the reality is that um, there's, a, there's a real environmental justice component to that um, that's, that's notable and, and, and real. Uh, the other thing uh, that happens that's also acute is the diesel generators that are happening behind the meter have extremely severe uh, localized health impact. Um, and so uh, the ability to reduce emissions uh, from diesel generation uh, with a battery storage behind the meter in a microgrid situation uh, is enormous. Um, and so there's uh, that, that local pollutant emissions component uh, really important with the battery storage behind the meter as well. Um, just to underscore again, the costs and, and bringing the duck curve back into it. This is giving a real look at what the rate structure looks like. And with the battery storage, um, you're really just trying to, uh, you're looking at that orange uh, part of the, of the bar chart um, and, and you're trying to use as little power during that uh, time as possible. That windows uh, often two, three, or can be 10 times, uh, 20 times as expensive depending on, a, uh, on the day uh, as the green part of those bars. And so uh, battery storage, uh, whether it's front or behind the meter, um, again, that's, that's really what we're trying to attack. Um, and as if to further, <laughs> uh, again, uh, because I imagine there may be questions I wanted to, again, just show this, uh, got battery storage um, both at the at the plant um, in the middle uh, and on the uh, on the transmission distribution grid and then behind the meter um, and ultimately this lands um, with a few I think really key takeaways for Brisbane. One is that uh, battery storage at this scale is desperately needed, whether front behind of the meter. There's absolutely no way that we get to 100% renewables without battery storage. The Biden plan uh, very clearly uh, makes this a real priority, but the, there's never been a modeling done of a grid that gets to high penetration of renewables without battery storage. And it's pretty obvious the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. And to deal with that intermittency, uh, you need battery storage. Uh, and so this is a part of you know, the, the most important and urgent problem uh, of our time, which is, which is mitigating carbon emissions and, and fighting climate change. And so, uh, you know, to, to, to widen the lens a little bit, uh, let there be no doubt that, that utility scale storage uh, is just utterly critical to our future, um, you know, as a grid and as a community and as a, as a globe. Um, support, you know, dealing with the California wide issue um, and the California specific issues of supply and demand mismatch, again, surfaced uh, last summer. Uh, it hadn't happened since the Enron. Um, fiasco of, of two decades ago, but again, supply and demand and, and a mismatch is, is something that is of great concern in California and battery storage um, plays a somewhat obvious role to help balance the, the mismatch of supply and demand. Uh, and then again, I, I just want to be clear, and I think it's important for everybody to realize, um, it's not a microgrid if it's on the front side of the meter. Um, and so even if it's uh, within, even if you can see it with your own eyes, uh, if that battery storage installation is on the other side of the meter, it's a part of a centralized power grid that, that might have to turn off and, um, and it's on the wrong side of the meter uh, when it does because it, 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 it can't provide that backup power. So, um, so that's, uh, uh, yeah, three minutes over the 20 I was aiming for here at this hour. Um, e eager to answer any questions and, um, and address anything we might have missed. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that.
Okay, thank you, Sam. Um, any questions for Sam? I do, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Eric, go ahead. Um, so the size of, how many acres is this site? Uh, this site here is just a couple. Um, I'm eyeballing here, so of course I'm going to get it wrong. But uh, but this is this is no more than um, than a couple of acres. Okay, and you said that there's at 30 feet away. It sounds like a vacuum cleaner. That's right. Now, are you talking about a vacuum cleaner that you're standing 30 feet away from, or a vacuum cleaner that is right next to you? when you're 30 feet away? Um, it's a very good question. As those words were coming out of my mouth, I was wondering the same thing. I think it is a vacuum cleaner that you are also 30 feet away from. Um, but yeah, so good catch. It is a, a vacuum cleaner that you would be 30 feet away from. Uh, but given the, yeah. So your so neighbor's think, vacuuming. That's right. Yeah, as if they were vacuuming outside. So, so you can hear it kind of annoying but but not it it's I think, not no, I think I think I'm thinking of it backwards but anyway um and then you mentioned the in, that it doesn't have a large impact on residents but what does it have the impact on wildlife um that's a very good question and something near and dear to my heart um I, Andrea, I'm sure that you have thoughts on this. Uh, I, I think ultimately the impact on wildlife is that we're reducing um, large uh, natural gas power plants and coal power plants. Um, and so to the extent that the battery storage is impacting that at a grid scale, that's enormously helpful. Now, I, I have a sense that you're asking about very specifically what happens, for instance, in that location uh, in Texas. Um, the short answer is I'm not sure. Uh, Andrea, yeah. do, you, do you know? You know, I think it would be, um, I, there's no emissions from these storage, the storage or anything um, itself. So I don't know that there is actually environmental impact at the site where it's located. The bigger picture of how it impacts our environment is that uh, storage, uh, taking fossil fuels out of the um of course, uh, energy production of course. Mix, you know, reduces emissions and climate change and so on. So, okay. More um, I'm sure that it has impact, the noise impacts would have impact on local wildlife. It could. Um, but, okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think you're right. And I, I think it would, right? No doubt that it would have some, but I, I think important to, it, it's, it's relative then to what? Because something will need to be done. And so if it was relative to a, a diesel generator, uh, that diesel generator would have a far more uh, a more negative impact on wildlife, I'd say. Yes. Okay, any other questions? I can't see anybody. I have one. Go ahead. So I think you mentioned that the lifespan on these is like, what, 20, 30 years? So what happens when like they're no longer usable. What's like the disposal process or something like that? Well, Madison, the takeaway here is that cat is adorable. Um, wow. she's, our, she's our mascot. She shows up at some point every council meeting without fail. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I have three of those little monsters running around here. Um, so the disposal process is, is something that, again, there are no battery storage installations like this that have been disposed of, to be clear. Um, so it is not something that um, there we can point and say they've done it well here. There are clear plans to do so, um, and the decommissioning process is thought to be, um, if, if you're judging it relative to decommissioning a power plant, a combustion-based power plant, it's kind of a non-issue. Um, but uh, the disposal of that waste is something that's real, but, but in context of what it's replacing, it's not a very big deal. Um, so yeah, that, that's the short answer and maybe not totally satisfactory, uh, but it's just given the, 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 where we are in terms of the timeline and maturity of the market. Um, it, you know, the, there are strong opinions on both sides. I'd say the solar develop, the storage developers would say it's an absolute non-issue. There are those that think um, that this, you know, will make the world come to an end. The truth is nobody really has any data um, 
And so, you know, uh, it, it, and of course it would land someplace in between those two things, but I think it would tend to be closer to uh, something that's, that we will be able to manage pretty easily. Andrea, I know yeah. this is something that you've thought about and looked at as well, so. Yeah, and just to add, uh, I think I agree with all of that. Um, I, I do anticipate, I think we all anticipate that in this um, process of learning how to manage the waste or what will be the waste in 20, 25 years, you know, a lot of technology and um, methodologies around recycling. It's actually a very, uh, the lithium ion itself is actually very valuable. And so there will be a lot of incentive to try to figure out how to reuse it again. So I, um, I do believe there will be uh, sound technology and research developed to deal with commissioning, decommissioning. May I add something anecdotal here? Mm -hmm. I was listening to NPR yesterday, and this particular topic came up on NPR, and I can't, cannot remember who the, the person they were speaking with, but that person was talking very specifically about the, the push and the new, uh, new industry of reusing lithium-ion batteries and just removing them from the structure and doing something with them. So it's a... Yeah obviously being looked at very, very closely, but that's just anecdotal, by the way. Just no, that, that, that is yeah. very, that's true. And um, just to point out that lithium, it's a, you know, these are rare earth metals and they're rare for a reason. <laughs> and we need to use them carefully and we need to reuse them. Um, and they are very expensive. And, and it, it's been at a smaller scale, but certainly we have dealt with the disposal of lithium ion batteries, which are the basis of, uh, you know, the, the battery that might be in the computer, uh, if you have a laptop in front of you. So <laughs> it is a tech that, um, you know, that, that there is, it, and I will say that, that it is a tech that, that the longer that those of us that are in this industry go, it seems as though it gets better and we continue to find better and, and more uses of the batteries at the end of what we thought was their life. Um, and I, so I'd say directionally, it feels like things are, 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 are better usually than anticipated and our, our, our advancements in technology and R&D seem to be quite good. Okay, Colleen, Cliff, any questions? I have questions. Go ahead. Okay, first of all, um, who are typically the customers of these battery storage companies? Are they selling to utility companies, specifically sometimes to commercial customers or maybe sometimes residential customers or all of the above? All of the above, yeah. And so, um, yeah, and, and this, this slide is, is good, but not great here, uh, other than being a little bit hard to read. Um, the customer here uh, is the utility itself. Um, in the instance of the, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the, the one at the very bottom here, uh, and then you have commercial use. And so um, it's, it's effectively pretty nicely split at this juncture between the customer being the utility, the customer being a commercial entity and the customer being a residential entity. Um, I think that moving forward, there's a very open question about where that will move. Um, there are those that think that distributed resources behind the meter uh, are the way the world will, will, will move. And there are those that think that, um, that the front of the meter resources are the other. But you have, um, you have parties, again, that are receiving benefits. And so I think you're gonna have customers in each place. And, and again, you do have customers that are the renewable energy developers too. So um, there, are, there are a lot of battery storage. There's some almost... You rarely see a big solar farm go go in now or, or a new wind farm without storage on site to deal with curtailment and to deal with the intermittency. So, um, yeah, you've got customers at each place on that grid from the power plant to the to the owner uh, and operator of the grid to the to the user of that grid, uh, whether it's a home or a business. And, and just to be very clear on the utility scale that we were um, so, for instance, at Martin substation that would be PG&E um, putting in and out power from, to those batteries. And so they are the relationship directly. And, and why wouldn't the utility company have their own battery storage? Well, that would be their own battery storage. So, so what we're trying to say is that on PG&E's grid in front of um, your home meter, 
um, they are looking actively for places to put storage on the grid so that they can do the curtailment that we need and that it, they are the direct customer there of the storage. Okay. And I have another question. What's the safety protocol for a large scale battery storage site? The photo that you have there shows a lot of land cleared. And also, is there any electric magnetic energy that's radiated from these? On the latter, that's an issue that's, that is raised a lot and, and it's usually um, it's something that it, that that is uh, uh, that is a non-issue uh, relative to the, um, the radiation you have in, in an everyday, your everyday life. Um, with respect to the safety, um, Andrea, do you have a take on the, on the safety component? You know, I think I, um, I am sure there are very technical standards that state that. I do not know them. Um, but I, am, I, uh, I know they have to be around, you know, fire protection, um, uh, you know, the, the noise issue, uh, there are, I'm sure many, many, um, regulations around that. Um, and, and that would absolutely be required for any installation. Um, uh, so that, that's just an area I don't know very much about right now, but they, okay. they are Thank there you. and they do need to be required. Was that all your questions, Colleen? That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, Cliff, did you have questions? Uh, I did, Matt. Uh, excuse me, thank you. Uh, hi, Andrea, and how you doing? Hi, Cliff. It's great to see it's you. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, nice to meet you, Sam. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you know, I, I'm so glad that you guys are our, our sustainability consultants. Um, you guys are some of the best in the business, and... Um, you know, it was great working with you on the framework and um, you, you really have, have positioned uh, our city to be able to have that foundation to, you know, go toe to toe with the developer. They're gonna present their sustainability vision and we're gonna be able through your efforts uh, to be able to say, yeah, that's a great idea or I don't think so. You, you're, you're underperforming and here's, just the best way to do it. So, um, you know, looking at this, this, uh, this opportunity here to, to be able to capture the alternative energy in a way that then allows you to be 100% renewable. Um, I, I, that's just such a, a game changer. Um, so, you know, looking at this site here, I, I, I have to say I was a little surprised at it because, um, you know, there's been some some battery storage uh, players uh, in the business who, who, who are looking at Brisbane. And, and and they've talked about putting it in these buildings. It, you know, the storage is going to be in this like two story building or whatever. And here the, this side is open. So um, out in the Baylands, it, could it be like this or could it be in a building? Yeah, so it was intentional to pick this picture um, because, again, easy to easy that and, and you were right that it, you think it's going to go into a into the building because because um, and because it can now it wouldn't be a shipping container but these are modules and so that shipping container is essentially made up that's a Tesla uh, Mega Pack that's made up of a ton of power walls and so the power wall is the thing that you can buy uh, for your own home uh, and so. Um, so you, you, not literally, but but essentially, you can take any one of those uh, mega packs and split it into uh, a couple of thousand um, power walls, and so it has, and it, you know, it has the same capacity. Um, the cost is obviously higher, uh, maybe a two x uh, cost to go into the home, the building, uh, versus uh, in in an open area like that. Um, so. Uh, the thing that I will just say transparently is uh, in this space, and it drives me insane, everybody wants to be all things all the time to all people. And it just doesn't work like that in the real world. And so you'll often um, hear, yeah, we're going to deal uh, with supply demand uh, imbalance. And then we're also going to have that battery ready to go for backup power. Well, what if you discharge the battery to deal with the supply demand imbalance? and then a storm hits 
and you've discharged your battery. You can't do both of those things. So there are things that are that that are not synergistic um, in the stack of things that a battery can do. Um, and then there are things that it can do when it's in a field like that that it can't do when it's behind your meter. And again, that's the the key here is that I think um, on its face there's a sense that you want the battery storage to help you get through the event this fall. Uh, that's inevitable, um, you know, in the Bay, I'm speaking Bay generally, um, it, it doesn't get you through that event when it's like this. Um, even again, even though it might seem that it's just close, so it's going to provide the backup power, it doesn't work like that. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that's the fundamental question is, um, is whether you use this as a truly distributed energy resource on your side of the meter, yours being you know, uh, where are those homes and buildings might be or whether it's on the other side. Um, but I will say that the neat thing about this on either side is that the word net is doing a lot of work when you go net zero because you very conveniently are able to produce the power whenever you want and overproduce and net it out when you need to buy power from the grid when the sun isn't shining. What is great about the battery storage is it moves us towards true zero emissions um, and, and not net zero emissions, where again, the word net is doing a lot of work. So I, th I do think that, you know, while there are different benefits as to whether it's going to be out, out in the field or, or in the building, it does, it does move us towards as a grid, no matter what, a more renewable solution and a, and a zero carbon, zero energy solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, no, thank you for that clarification. So kind of looking at the, um, you know, in front of the grid or behind the, behind, front of the meter, behind the meter. So, you know, yesterday we had a present, you know, Karen and I were, uh, the mayor and I uh, had a um, presentation by BDI showing their alternative energy, you know, potential uh, for the site and, and, and really, focusing a lot on the battery storage and, and creating a microgrid. So, it, and, and you, you, you were talking a lot about that, Sam. So if you, if you create that microgrid, now you're in, in a sense immune from when the power goes out for everybody else, because you, you, you created this power on site during the day and now you've stored your energy that you could then distribute in your grid and that grid could be not only the Baylands, but it could be the rest of Brisbane or other parts of the region as well. Is that, is that correct? It, there's a, so there's a little bit to unpack there. If, if it was Bayland specifically, then it is, it is easy to imagine if it was on that side of the meter, that that could be fully what's called islanded from the grid and operate as its own grid. And that's, and, and so, and depending on the solar generation, um, you could go for a long time. We have a project that, that I'm involved in, in in the north side of the bay um, where we believe we can actually take um, a, a pretty big uh, two building uh, kind of compound off of the grid, uh, period. And so, um, and so that can happen at the kind of scale we're talking about. Um, but uh, but that's, that is easier said than done when you start thinking about other buildings coming into it, other homes coming into it, the rest of, of Brisbane coming into it. Because you are creating, and this is recorded in public, so my apologies to PG&E in advance of these comments, but this is not what PG&E wants you to do. PG&E, they sure. make money by their exclusive franchise to distribute power. Exactly. And what you're doing is you're essentially violating what is a, a over a hundred year old franchise uh, to, to be the only one that can do that. And so when you do it behind your own meter and you're not bringing in new owners, then that works and you can, you can get that permitted. When you start going across the streets and start going to new, you know, other buildings, other owners, uh, pg and uh, gonna come in and it's gonna be a holy war. Now that's coming no matter what that war is, is being fought and, and, and you starting to see these little it's kind of skirmishes, but um, you know, that's an open question about what will happen over the next decade um, from a regulatory perspective. Do, do we allow 
uh, an installation like that that could physically serve all of Brisbane? Uh, do we allow that to happen because it's physically able and it would be a more robust, um, you know, kind of anti-fragile uh, solution? But to be clear, that's it, it is it's a big, big deal and essentially begins uh, the beginning of what PG&E would see as the end. I mean, truly existential uh, uh, threat to, to PG&E and, and all other monopoly utilities across the country. Yeah. Well, you know, you also talk about on-site battery storage. So if you had buildings with on-site storage and, and, and we start to you know, expand that, that type of capability, that could also be part of your microgrid as well. Yes, yeah, so exactly. You can you can imagine, you know, for lack of, for, to simplify it, if you had a big commercial building and you had a parking garage and you took up 10 spaces in the parking garage, you could have, we'll just say five megawatts, you could send that power and connect that to other buildings near it. Or you could just put, take one parking space and 10 buildings and, and do it that way. So it's kind of like the, the micro and the nano grid and, and it's how distributed you want to get. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, of course, the, the more distributed, the more robust it is. So you, you are best if you have, um, you know, some power walls in, in your home. Uh, it's, it's in your home and, and, and you control it. So, you know, there, there, is, there is a notion that you do ultimately, you know, want to distribute as much as you can, but then the, the headwind there is economics. And, you know, you do see economies of scale that are real um, when you put 10 parking spaces worth of batteries together. Um, and in, in this instance, put together, you know, 40 shipping containers worth. So that's, those are the kind of, I think, competing interests there. And it really is cost that, that drives the interest to have it not quite as distributed as you might be able to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just thinking, you know, of the Baylands, I mean, if that's where the battery storage uh, is located and you have, you know, basically a, a blank slate. So, you, you know, part of the requirement of, of the city, you know, as, as its goal to, to, uh, to achieve, you know, zero carbon, to, to want to achieve 100% renewable, you, you know, some of these, you know, I guess the requirement could be that, that, all buildings of a certain scale would be required to have um, battery storage on site as part of their, you know, like an overall, you know, sustainable uh, energy um, strategy or, or policy. Yeah, and and the other factor that we haven't mentioned is 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 the solar, um, and so the thing that that is happening here is that we've it another thing that's easily conflated. Sometimes you just think, well, it's battery, so it's going to be renewable. The truth is it's not renewable if it's connected to the grid, it's charging from the grid that's dirty. Um, and so you, the co-location of solar is important, but you don't need it to make a lot of these things work. So important component of the discussion here is whether you're co-locating solar as a part of this. And so I think prospectively, as you think about mandates, um, you know, the, the state mandate, uh, moving towards, you know, have to have solar on all new construction. Mm -hmm. Then when you're co-locating uh, storage there, um, it, it has kind of a, you know, a, a multiplier effect. Um, and again, when the, when you're thinking about this as a, um, in a grid outage event, uh, you're not just depleting the battery, you have a fuel source and your own power plant on your home or in your neighborhood or wherever it is in the form of this, of the solar panels. Um, so you're able to get, you know, again, it's a very robust solution to deal with grid outages and the, and the kind of antiquated centralized grid that, that, that worked so well for a hundred years and kind of kept getting better. You know, the grid kept expanding and more people had electricity. And we are now at the spot where it's getting worse. The power outages are getting more frequent. And it's, and so, you know, that, that thing that worked so well, um, is, is now not working so well. And so that's, that's what leads us to all these things. And then just my last question. Um, so, you know, we talk a lot about solar uh, energy generation, you, you know, and that energy going into these uh, batteries. Um, 
to be stored, but are there other ways of generating energy, um, particularly at the Baylands, that could be also part of the overall energy generation strategy uh, for Uber's name? Yeah, I mean, Cliff, as you recall, we looked at that in some detail in the framework. Um, and I think we don't think there's a lot of potential for wind just because of the location and siting and so on. Um, other things, um, you know, geo exchange, geothermal. This is being used in sites um, here in California and elsewhere. Basically provides carbon free, uh, basically earth um, heat and cool <laughs> uh, to buildings um, through heat pump systems and so on. And so that is another uh, option that would be you know, replacing some of the need for solar generation to supply um, uh, space heating and cooling, um, you know, in terms of power. So there are definitely other technologies that can be looked at. That's more kind of the building scale. It's not the um, energy, uh, it's, uh, it's not an energy generation technology, but it is part of a uh, net zero carbon and net zero energy um, strategy for sure. Um, yeah. And, you know, people in this instance would say, well, fuel cells are, well, I mean, fuel cells are a technology. They're just not commercially viable, just, just incredibly expensive or need natural gas to work. Uh, the other thing is anaerobic digestion with, with waste that that's a technology that, that is kind of commercially viable, but won't get you to the scale you need. Right. Um, so those two don't really work. And as Andrea said, wind doesn't really work. And so I love that Andrea stole what I would have said, which was the first fuel is the fuel your, is energy efficiency. And so the first fuel you can look at and need to on in any situation like this is, you know, how do you use less of, of the stuff in the first place? You know, how do you want your, your phone to, to get through? You know, you can go find one of those battery packs, but the first thing you do is you put your phone into low power mode and turn down you know, the, the brightness of your screen. And that's what you need with for your buildings is to is to find the low power mode so that you don't need as much, uh, you know, solar and battery storage to back it up in the first place. All right, thank you very much. This is great. Other questions or comments from city council? I see. None. Inger, does anybody, any legitimate person want to say something? I see a, a scammer there. Um, I did want to note that we, um, the council received correspondence from Dana Dilworth regarding this item. And Premom had a question. Um, would a significant battery storage facility situated on the Baylands near the previously mentioned station, would Brisbane be protected from rolling blackouts? It, de it depends on which side of the meter. And so it, 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 it I think it's, it's, it's easy to, it, it could be cited was effectively right next to the development um, and, and might feel like it would, but it, but it wouldn't if it's on, on the front of the meter, but if it's behind the meter and, and in the buildings or, uh, or distributed you know, within the development, then that would, um, that would very clearly uh, protect and provide backup power to get through those rolling backouts. Okay. You good? Anybody else? Um, I have received no other comments. All right. Sam, Andrea, thank you so much for this presentation and all your time and, uh, I'm learning a lot. This is this is a, a very, very sharp learning curve, I think, for all of us <laughs> on this battery storage. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. See you, well. see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Okay. We are moving on to item 10, staff reports. Item J, city manager's report on upcoming activities. Clay, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we'll be putting some things on the screen here in just a second. Okay. 
Okay, so the city manager's report for May 6th. The first item is the 2021 Supervisor, Supervisor getting late at night, Supervisors <laughs> District Lines Advisory Commission. Uh, there is uh, an 11 member County uh, Board of Supervisors um, commission that will be studying and making recommendations. If you're interested in uh, applying and that's anybody uh, that's uh, a San Mateo County resident can apply to be part of this. Um, the application time is uh, June 4th and you go on to um, cmo.smcgov.org uh, slash district lines. Uh, the county has brought back their mass vax sites that uh, supply uh, has increased. Uh, you can go on to my turn to California, my turn .ca .gov, um, and anticipate having these max vax clinics two times a week. Uh, you can also see um, its locations and times on smchealth.org. Um, we will, uh, there will be a free COVID-19 vaccine clinics. Um, uh, there was one today over in the Pacelli Center, which is at 145 Lake Merced Boulevard, uh, tomorrow at, um, uh, May 7th at 1 PM for anyone 18 and older. And then again, um, in South San Francisco on, uh, Linden Avenue at 616 Linden Avenue on Saturday at 10 AM. And that will be for as long as, uh, supplies last. Um, just a reminder that uh, testing is still going on and the county is um, uh, recommending that people uh, continue to get tested. Um, weekly mobile testing is at our um, part site um, between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Um, part of that time is coterminous with the um, farmer's market. Um, the annual vegetation reduction in Bateman program, um, our letters will be mailed out next week to all property owners detailing new requirements that the city council just passed last month uh, for the city's prior prevention cold code. The goal is to clear properties by June 1st of 2021, thus avoiding abatement noise, no, notices and uh, penalties. Um, letters and more information can be found on our website at brisbaneca.org. And I believe that's it for the night. Thank you, Clay. So moving on to item 11, uh, Mayor Council Matters. Um, item K, consider authorizing submission of letter of support for SB 612 ratepayer equity. Supporting the bill ensures fair and equal access to the benefits of legacy contracts, resources for all customers, and ensures that investor-owned utility portfolios are managed to maximize value and reduce unnecessary costs for all customers. I guess. So this. <laughs> this so this letter was uh, brought to us by uh, by the um, uh, clean energy. I'm, I'm brain dead. Yes, and Colleen, you're the representative on that. They put this forward, so you think we should approve it? You're on mute, Colleen. Okay, thank you. Simple explanation, when you were on PG&E, PG&E invested in all kinds of other renewables as extra sources. There was an upfront cost to that. When people left and went to Peninsula Clean Energy, now PG&E says, you still have to pay for it. And Peninsula Clean Energy is saying, but we're not getting the benefit and you're charging our customers. So this bill would correct that and say, okay, you want to charge our customers, then we still get to use that energy. Does that make sense? So I would recommend it. It will lower our rates on PCE power. Great. Sounds like a good motion to me. Second. 
Okay, uh, so we have a first and a second to approve authorizing the submission letter in support of SB 612, Ratepayer Equity. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member Mackin? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Cunningham? Aye. Thank you. Um, item L is to review council assignments and city council subcommittees. Um, and then I is the council ad hoc subcommittee on gun safety. Staff report, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this is an item requesting uh, two council members um, be assigned to an ad hoc subcommittee to work with the police chief, uh, legal counsel, and the city manager uh, with regards to um, potential uh, ordinance um, on safe storage. Uh, this has been brought to your attention by a Brisbane citizen uh, with a group called Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. Uh, the group is promoting safety and gun ownership while believing that the Second Amendment can be respected while simultaneously better protecting people through common sense gun legislation. Um, so we're asking tonight that uh, two members of the uh, council be um, identified as a ad hoc subcommittee. Can I ask a question? And I don't want to get too deep into this, but um, <clears throat> several years ago, we had to rewrite our entire um, code because of a threat from a lawsuit from gun rights people. And it took us a long time and it cost us a lot of attorney time. And I'm wondering if that's still the case and would be, be just attacking our resources by doing this again. Well, I think the first, I, the, the, I, um, the, the idea is to do a quick review of um, city, state and federal law that's relative to this uh, subject matter area, see where we stand and then get legal guidance in terms of um, strategy in terms of moving forward. I think we can do that with a relatively um, small expenditure of time. And if it looks like it's going to be a significant expenditure of time, then we would come back to the council before we did that. I mean, the last time we went through this process, it was because some gun rights people could pick on us. And I would just hate opening that door again. Understood. I mean, Madam Mayor, uh, Clay, isn't there uh, an ordinance that's at the county level? In regards to um, yeah, I believe the county, um, <coughs> the unincorporated parts of San Mateo County um, and some other cities in the county have adopted this, um, this legislation. Um, and then, you know, I don't know, um, I don't know of any legal action that's been taken at this point in time, but I think that's one of the things that we want to look at and see uh, just kind of where things stand. Okay, so one of the options that we could do is like with the secondhand smoke and the plastic bag ban, we could potentially piggyback on uh, an ordinance that um, has been vetted through the county. Um, yeah, I think uh, the, the, the proposed, what came to you had uh, been actually been through the county. So yes, to, to answer your question. Okay. And you, and you feel that the best way is to kind of get through this is through an ad hoc committee to just kind of flesh it out. Yeah, just the vet the issue, um, make sure we all understand exactly what rules are on the board on the books right now. Um, and um, I think uh, Councilman O'Connell is um, correct. I think we certainly want to have our city attorney look at it. And, you know, if we're going to be uh, venturing into um, potentially troubled waters, we at least ought to know that before we do it. All right, thanks. Madison, Colleen, any comments? Oh, I, I, I think we should investigate it. So are you volunteering to be on this subcommittee? Sure. Yeah, I'll volunteer too. You, you and I are not a subcommittee or ad hoc committee, so um, that'd be nice, Colleen. Good. Okay, is there any other discussion? Okay, so can I get a first and a second to create the Council Ad Hoc Subcommittee on Gun Safety with Colleen Mackin and Cliff Lentz as members of the subcommittee? So moved. 
I'll second. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member Mackin? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Cunningham? Aye. Um, item two is assign council member to the heart of San Mateo County's membership agency, MAC, M-A-C. The purpose of MAC is to provide cities which do not have a seat on the heart board an opportunity to comment on HART's financial and program activities. Uh, are the members of the housing, af affordable housing subcommittee interested in being on this membership committee as representatives? Mr. Madison, are you interested in doing that? I, I did attend uh, the, the meeting yesterday. I am concerned about being on this because I want to take advantage of Hart's um, offerings. And last time I was looking at taking advantage of a first time home buyer program with the city, I couldn't because I'm on the city council. So I really don't want to risk me, you know, making it so that I, I can't, <laughs> I want to have as many options as possible to buy a house. So I don't want to risk my involvement with heart or anything beyond the city council to diminish my other resources that are available to me. No problem. I, I, I'll do it. Not and clear. Um, Colleen, do you want to be the alternate on this? I don't really know much of anything about it. So I feel a little bit apprehensive. I, I'm really totally in the dark. I don't even know what this does. So okay. If well, it's, me to be an it, I can, but I won't know it, anything it, about it. It's not difficult, Colleen. You know, um, you know, basically, heart. It, 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 you know, it, you know, they, their their mission is to to raise funds uh, for affordable housing. They have a first time buyer program. That's one of their their big things. Um, and, and so they, 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 they partnered with the county, um, some financial institutions, and then they, they go and lend the money to, to build affordable housing. They might partner with the school district. They might partner with the city. One of the things that we've been trying to do is see if there's a way where we could partner with HART to, to use our affordable housing funds and sites that we own um, to get that low interest loan and make that project happen. And then part gets paid back and then they put the money back into the system. That's kind of it. Okay, okay, fine. All right, can we make you the alternate? Sure. If always shows up, right? When are the meetings? <laughs> yeah, when are the meetings? There's not very many. So uh, the hard board meets on a regular basis and Mac, you know, they, they meet, I don't know, Maybe a Annually. couple times a year, Annually. not very often. Annually. Ingrid says annually. Okay, there you go. So we won't have to meet <laughs> until next year. Okay. And and only as the alternate, if Cliff doesn't do it. Okay. okay. So, so uh, can I get a first and second to add heart of San Mateo County's membership agency committee, MAC, to the assignment li assignments list with Cliff Lentz as the representative and Colleen Mackin as the alternate on the members of MAC. So moved. I'll second it. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member Mackin? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Cunningham? Aye. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item M, countywide assignments and subcommittee reports. Cliff, why don't you start? All right, Madam Mayor. Um, so yesterday I was at the MAC uh, annual meeting and um, they talked about the things that I just spoke to you, Colleen, about what they do. So it was very informative. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you and I, uh, Karen, had a couple of meetings with BDI yesterday. Um, you know, on battery storage and energy uh, generation. So 
covered yeah. quite a bit by Andrea and Sam. And then, uh, and then this morning uh, we had a, a meeting with uh, BDI in regards to water, and um, they're wanting the city to to help in that effort. And um, that was the discussion. Okay, Madison. I had a subcommittee with you, Karen, Public Art Advisory Committee, uh, basically just kind of talking about what the status of the skate park sort of mural project is. Um, and we are going to put it on hold for now, um, consider working on a different project or maybe consider another RFP um we also talked about the mural on midtown it's going to be um refreshed and updated we're just trying to figure out a time when the muralist has um a break in her schedule to be able to come and do it but hopefully i think over the summer and we're gonna prep it and clean it and do all the stuff um, when we get a date from her so that it can be ready to be touched up that's awesome. And Thanks. we'll also be looking at the um, public arts ordinance again. Yeah, we are. We talked about reviewing, th making some changes to the ordinance based on um, what we have learned from doing our first official project. And um, we will probably be bringing that back to the full council, some suggestions on how we think that the ordinance can be improved to ensure the committee can um, move forward in an easier manner with certain projects. Is the a question for you, and I know this really isn't question and answer time, has the library project been installed? Mm, that's for a staff question, I don't know. I was in there and I didn't see it when we were doing the opening ceremony. So I think Stuart would know. I believe it has, because it's on the back. It's on the back wall, so you wouldn't see it from being inside the library. No, no, no. The butterflies. Oh, the butter. I thought you meant the one from the. No, the but that, that one has not. Butterflies. The butterfly one has not. We are. Um, it got delayed due to COVID. The artist has a very high risk profile when it comes to COVID. So we were just waiting until um, she was better able to travel. But she has them, all the butterflies are finished. She is, we were just waiting and probably until after she, her, after she has had her second shot and is able to travel more easily. Great, thank you. But she's from like Massachusetts, I think. Yeah, she's from Massachusetts. I mean, what she, she was gonna, she's gonna drive across country. Um, and so the idea was to wait and wait a little bit longer since the library isn't fully open to everybody and to give her to give a chance for people to feel a little bit more comfortable traveling with co you know during the covid period okay thank you um anything else madison Not. Okay, so uh, I think Terry. Colleen and I both had a couple um, subcommittee meet or we had subcommittee meetings on the infrastructure, but those are all things that came before us tonight. So I think that's all I can add at this late hour for me. Right. Thank you. Colleen. Then Peninsula Clean Energy, if you need a water heater, I highly recommend go to the Peninsula Clean Energy website and look at their rebates, $2,500, a lot of money. Um, these are all electric, state-of-the-art, they'll save on carbon emissions. Uh, Want to report that now 97.2% of eligible accounts in the Peninsula cities are on Peninsula Clean Energy, which is big. Uh, if you're interested in solar, uh, Sunrun does a partner program with Peninsula 
clean energy. It's solar plus storage. We were just talking about battery storage tonight. They have staff now um, from Sunrun in a booth at Home Depot, so you can talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And finally, if there's any developers and contractors locally or residents interested in all electric buildings, there's technical assistance available. Um, go to website www.allelectricdesign.org and there's all kinds of information, um, further training and education. Thank you. All right, and my committees have been covered, so we're good. Um, so moving on to item N, city council meeting schedule. Our next city council meeting is on May the 20th. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, written communications. Okay. We had um, written communication from Clara Johnson, Lyle Covino, uh, Isabella Sanchez, and four from Dana Dilworth. And moving on to item 12, oral communications number two. Ingrid, is there anybody who would like to speak mm. at this time? Make any public comments? I see no hands raised, Madam Mayor, and I received no written correspondence or text messages. Great. So we move on to item 13, which everybody's waiting for, which is adjournment to the meeting of May 20th. Good night, everybody. The City Council meeting of May 6th, 2021 is now adjourned. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.